to the William H. Rehnquist Center's annual Constitution Day Supreme Court Review. Uh, I'm Andrew Cohen, I'm the Associate Director of the Center, and I'm here uh, to introduce our panelists uh, and our moderator. Just to tell you a few words about the Rehnquist Center itself, uh, which was established here uh, at the University of Arizona's James E. Rogers College of Law uh, back in 2006. Uh, as a non-partisan center to honor uh, the legacy uh, of uh, the late uh, Chief Justice William H. Uh, Rehnquist by promoting a uh, study of the structural elements of the Constitution that were so central to his jurisprudence. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to introduce our excellent uh, panelists uh, here today. Uh, I'll start with uh, Judge Murray Snow, uh, who is uh, the third um, from my right. Uh, who is the U.S. District Judge, a U.S. District Judge, uh, for the District of Arizona. Um, and we're pleased to welcome uh, Judge Snow here back. Um, he's uh, been part of our panel at uh, least once before, I think a couple of times. Um, uh, Lisa Manline uh, is uh, immediately to my right, uh, an Associate Professor of Law at the University of Washington. Uh, Tony Massaro, well known uh, to many members uh, of our community here, uh, on my far right, uh, uh, is the Dean Emerita of uh, the James E. Rogers College of Law, uh, and Regents Professor and the Milton O. Reapy uh, Chair uh, at the James E. Rogers College of Law. Uh, and then, uh, second from my right, uh, is uh, Ryan Dorfler, here with us for the first time. He was an Assistant Professor of Law at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I will turn things over uh, to our moderator, I think really impresario is maybe the better word here, um, Professor David Marcus uh, of uh, the J.P. Rogers College of Law, who is also the 1885 Distinguished Scholar. Before I do, I just wanted to point out uh, the CLE sign-up sheet uh, in the center of the room here, right in front of the video cameras. For everyone uh, who is uh, hoping uh, to receive CLA credit for this afternoon's uh, presentations, uh, there's the sign-up sheet right there. I'll turn it over to David. Uh, well, thank you all for coming. It's really wonderful to see uh, this crowd uh, this afternoon uh, uh, taking the time to join us to celebrate the Constitution, to review some of the past uh, terms, decisions, and to talk about uh, some uh, uh, a couple of episodes that will will raise some really difficult and profound constitutional questions in the near future. Uh, the way that we'll proceed is I, I'm going to take about 10 minutes. It's a little bit more than 10 minutes, a couple of instances, uh, but close to 10 minutes to summarize uh, the cases that we'll discuss uh, one by one. I'll, I'll summarize a case and then we'll have a discussion. Uh, and we'll do that so for 45 minute chunks, we'll, we'll have about 45 minutes for each, uh, each of the two cases and the two episodes that we'll discuss. Uh, um, I'm hopeful to have plenty of time for your questions and your comments. Uh, so uh, I will try to moderate such that there is that time. So please be, be ready to, to fire away. Uh, so I'll present, I'll present each of these episodes, and then we will uh, I'll turn things over to the panel. I've got some questions, and, and we, in years past, we've had the panel panelists prepare comments and remarks in each case, kind of going down the road. But I'm hopeful this year is we'll have more of a, a sort of a back and forth, free flowing conversation um, uh, about uh, what we're talking about. Okay, so the first the first case before us is a, is a decision from this past term, the uh, Trinity Lutheran case. That's right, right? Trinity Lutheran. Great. Okay, we're all on the same board. Now, I've been summarizing cases for Constitution Day for a long time now. Most years after the exercises are over, Tony Massaro, our con law expert extraordinaire, sends me a nice email complimenting me, the con law novice, on my work. It's sort of the verbal equivalent of giving a puppy a treat for not peeing on the carpet. Um, <laughs> a puppy, I crave the treat, you know, I really crave it. Every three or four years, uh, however, I have to summarize a, a religion case involving the First Amendment. Uh, I don't understand the First Amendment, especially the two clauses pertaining to religion. And it obviously shows because after the, the exercises are over during these years, I don't get my little Massaro puppy treat. Uh, uh, so my goal for Trinity, that's not most of the time I do anyway. But my goal for the Trinity Lutheran case is simply not to pee on the carpet, and then I'll turn things over to it. <laughs> Even a First Amendment puppy like me recognizes that Trinity Lutheran is a pretty big deal. It seems to portend a day when states not only can provide funding to parochial schools, but are required to do so. So let me start with some real basics. The First Amendment reads in pertinent part as follows. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. 
This text has two clauses. It has the establishment clause, Congress can't establish a state religion, and a free exercise clause. Congress can't interfere with a religious exercise. By the way, keep this in mind. Um, while the First Amendment refers to Congress, to limits on Congress's power, um, these limits have been incorporated through the 14th Amendment to apply to the states as well. Now, as the court has observed, these two clauses are frequently in tension. Here's a simple example. Let's say an aircraft carrier will sail for three months between ports of call. A Catholic crew member asks the Navy to order a Catholic chaplain to join the crew. Without the chaplain on board, she argues, she can't attend to her religious obligations uh, during those three months between ports. If the Navy refuses to pay for a chaplain to join the crew, does it violate her right to the free exercise of her religion? If the Navy does pay for the Catholic chaplain to join the crew, does it contribute to the establishment of religion? What is the Navy to do caught between the skilla of the establishment clause and the charybdis of free exercise? Well, Trinity Lutheran arguably poses just this dilemma. The state of Missouri runs something called the Scrap Tire Program. To reduce the number of used tires rotting in Missouri landfills, it offers grants to qualifying nonprofit organizations to incentivize them to purchase playground services made from recycled tires. The Trinity Lutheran Child Learning Center is a preschool in Columbia, Missouri. It has a playground that has a surface of coarse gravel that by all accounts from uh, first-hand observers is quite rough on four-year-old knees. Trinity Lutheran applied for a $20,000 grant to defray the $38,000 cost of a new playground surface. Trinity Lutheran's grant application was apparently terrific and would have easily merited funding but for one problem. The Missouri Constitution contains a provision that provides, quote, no money shall ever be taken from the public treasury directly or indirectly in aid of any church, sect, or denomination of religion. Now this godless communism is Missouri's little Blaine Amendment. <laughs> By the middle of the 19th century, Catholic immigrants that, from Ireland and Germany had begun to acquire uh, quite a considerable political power in large uh, cities like New York and Boston. One manifestation of this power was to get public funding for uh, education to get it directed toward Catholic parochial schools. Um, now, uh, recall in the 19th century, the First Amendment didn't apply to uh, uh, the state, so there was no federal constitutional prohibition on such funding. Protestant majorities started getting freaked out by the Catholic menace. In 1876, James Blaine, then a congressman and a Democratic nominee for president, proposed an amendment to the Constitution that would prohibit any state from funding churches or their affiliates. Now, it's hard to imagine, just trying to go back to those days, it's hard to imagine a presidential candidate stooping to rank nativism and bigotry to win votes. So just try to, try to think of how that might have been. Now, this effort to amend the U.S. Constitution fizzled, but a lot of states, ultimately 38, including Arizona, um, enacted their own little blame amendments. Uh, uh, so Missouri, Missouri's is that issue in this case. Now, Missouri's constitutional provision forbade it from giving Trinity Lutheran a grant. So Trinity Lutheran sued, arguing that the application of Missouri's little blame amendment in this instance would uh, violate the free exercise clause. The court ruled 7 to 2 in Trinity Lutheran's favor, the application of Missouri's constitution to uh, deny the preschool its grant uh, uh, was unconstitutional. Chief Justice Roberts, the majority opinion as author, makes it all seem so simple. We've rejected free exercise challenges, the chief says, when the laws in question have been neutral and generally applicable without regard to religion. For instance, an Oregon law that prohibited the use of peyote did not burden the free exercise of religion for members of a Native American church. The law didn't single out the church, it simply prohibited the use of the drug for everyone. But Missouri's policy expressly singles out religion. Robert's holding is stunning in its simplicity. If the cases make one thing clear, he insists, it is that such a policy imposes a penalty on the free exercise of religion that triggers the most exacting scrutiny. Under strict scrutiny, Missouri had to identify a compelling state interest in its little plain amendment. But Missouri says, no problem, we've got one. If we fund Trinity Lutheran's grant application, Missouri argues, we'll commit an establishment clause violation. Uh, indeed, this is precisely what Justice Sotomayor, uh, joined by Justice Ginsburg, argues in her dissent. Now, I'm just a puppy who needs to pee, but I think Justice Sotomayor has a pretty good argument. In, 2000, in a 2002 case called Zellman versus Simmons-Harris, the court held that parents could use vouchers provided by the state of Ohio to pay for their kids to attend parochial schools. The Ohio law basically said that parents could use the vouchers to send their kids to whatever school they wanted but 96% of the vouchers ended up getting used to send kids to parochial schools. The court held the program did not violate the Establishment Clause. The Establishment Clause is really concerned with instances when the government is seen as making a choice 
to favor religion. But when the parents make the decision to steer state money to religious schools, the government itself isn't really making that choice. Thus, the court held in Zoman, our decisions have drawn a consistent distinction between government programs that provide aid directly to religious schools and programs of true private choice in which government aid reaches religious schools only as a result of the genuine and independent choice of private individuals. By this logic, wouldn't Missouri violate the Establishment Clause that gave funds directly to Trinity Lutheran? And if so, isn't this a compelling state interest? Can't Missouri avoid the skilla of the Establishment Clause without getting sucked into the charybdis of free exercise? No, suggests the Chief, in a couple of cursory paragraphs. Uh, clearly, the majority of the court sees no Establishment Clause problem with the direct funding of religious schools. This is a pretty stunning conclusion that I see as being reached almost by implication in the decision. Now there's one more important piece of the puzzle because the court has addressed the situation before in a case called Locke versus Davey. Washington State has a scholarship program that gives modest college scholarships to outstanding Washington High School graduates with one limit. Although recipients can use their scholarship funds to uh, pay for the tuition at a, uh, a religiously affiliated university or college, um, no recipient could use scholarship funds to pursue a devotional degree, that is to train for ministry or the clergy. An otherwise eligible recipient sued when the state denied him a scholarship to fund his devotional degree program. The court rejected the student's free exercise challenge. The state doesn't penalize the exercise of religion, and it doesn't require students to choose between getting an education and their religious beliefs. Rather, the state simply has chosen not to fund the training of clergy. Thus, uh, this, the law court has insisted, strikes a nice balance between free exercise on one hand and the Establishment Clause on the other. Now, Lockheed e. Davy seems awfully close to the situation at issue in Trinity Lutheran, but it's not, the Chief Justice insists. Washington State has refused to, uh, refused to fund the student not because of who the student was, that is, religious, but because of wanted, what he wanted to do, that is, train for the clergy. Here, Missouri refuses to fund Trinity Lutheran because of what it is, a religious institution, not what it proposes to do, uh, resurface a playground. This status-based discrimination is odious to our Constitution, the Chief insists, and cannot be sustained. Now, this distinction between status and use strikes me as kind of silly, a point that Justice Garland, I, I mean Justice Gorsuch, my apologies, <laughs> points out in his concurrence. Money is fungible. The $20,000 in government funding that Trinity Lutheran gets to resurface its playground um, frees up $20,000 that it can spend on communion wine and Bibles. At the very least, the Trinity Lutheran case suggests that if a state makes funds available to charter schools and the like, a religious school should be able to demand these funds as well, so long as it insists that the funds will be spent on electricity bills, on security guards, and not on some kind of uh, religious uh, uh, expense. The real world effect, of course, would be direct state funding of religious schools. But I think the Supreme Court is planning to take the last step and not even require this facade of secularity. The holding has two parts. First, any state law that expressly singles out religion is subject to strict scrutiny as a likely violation of the Free Exercise Clause. And second, a state that provides funding directly to religious schools does not violate the Establishment Clause. What this means seems pretty clear to my puppy-sized brain. States will not only have the option of providing funding to religious schools, but may be constitutionally compelled to do so. There's a case from Colorado that uh, went up to the court. Um, uh, the Colorado Supreme Court invoked its own, the state's own blame amendment to deny uh, funding for public, uh, private, uh, religiously affiliated schools. Uh, the case went to the court. The court has remanded in the wake of Trinity Lutheran. So I expect this issue of uh, state funding, obligatory state funding for religious schools to come back pretty soon. Okay, so that's it. Um, I'm going to turn things over first to Dean Massaro and first ask her if I can have my little treat. <laughs> Did I pee on the carpet? No. Um, can anybody tell that uh, Dave and his wife just got a dog? His name is Douglas. They got a Douglas. <laughs> Um, the first question, well, when we were prompted, um, one of the questions you wanted us to answer was whether or not the, the court should be allowed to consider the history of the, these Blaine Amendments, which were clearly anti-Catholic. Um, and the NEC mentioned Missouri has it in their constitution. When deciding whether this, this block to funding going to, to uh, religious institutions interfered with the exercise. To that question, the answer is yes, but. The yes part is that uh, in the free exercise area, in the establishment clause area, in the equal protection area, and this becomes very important later when we get to the travel ban case, um, the doctrine requires 
the court to look first at the face of the measure and then uh, at the justifications of the measure to, to determine whether the actual purpose of it is what uh, the face uh, suggests it is. So, so pulling back and looking at the Blaine Amendments uh, and the, what animated them uh, would not be illegitimate on the part of the court. Um, however, there, it's a yes but for me, and you know, to cut to the chase, um, I don't know how much you know about Missouri, how much you know about the Trinity Lutheran Church, um, uh, or the demographics of the state. Generally speaking, what's happened since, what's happened in the area of the religion clauses, um, uh, really since the 1980s in particular, is that people believing that there should be more free exercise and less establishment clause um, uh, breaks on what the government can do, have won. Um, less under free exercise than they have in shrinking the establishment clause. And they've adopted a conscious strategy of borrowing from the civil rights movement and discussing a ways in which we treat religious institutions, religious actors, and religious beliefs as, as analogous um, to, if not on all fours, with how we treat um, people based on race, ethnicity, gender, etc. Um, and this is, to me, the wrong step. Uh, the court has very, been very careful to avoid using equal protection analysis per se, I think because they realize that taking religion into account is both necessary, uniquely necessary, and uniquely dangerous. And uh, underlying this case and the, the cases for the last several decades is a profound disagreement among the justices about organizing principles. You know, what should be our approach to thinking about what the Establishment Clause does and says they cannot do, and what the Free Exercise Clause says they must do in the way of accommodation. They've kept them separate, which left a large amount of what they call play in the joints, which enables states like Missouri and the government to experiment. And one of those experiments, I think, has been embracing or holding on to separation of church and state as a theory. It's not just about the Blaine Amendments, or it isn't anymore, I think. Um, uh, the demographics of the state of Missouri, 49% of the people of Missouri are religious or claim to be. The overwhelming percentage of those religious actors are Protestant. Um, the Lutheran Church, um, I was raised in the Lutheran Church. There are several synods. Uh, the Missouri Synod, the Trinity Lutheran Church here, is a Missouri Synod church. Um, uh, the idea that this, there shall be no money that flows to religious institutions as a political process breakdown in Missouri that evidences discrimination against Lutherans is ludicrous to me. I mean, it may have originally been discrimination against Catholics, but there isn't that kind of political process breakdown. And so another way of looking at what the state has tried to do is embrace a theory of the best way to juggle these maddeningly complex free exercise versus establishment clause principles, and perhaps embrace something that currently no member, I, maybe Justice Ginsburg, but no member of the United States Supreme Court embraces anymore. People continue to just say separation of church and state as though it were doctrinally viable, it is not. Um, instead, we have this accommodationist insistence on neutrality. Um, so that ship has sailed at the federal level. Um, but I think that it would be worth thinking about whether states should be permitted this area or this uh, play in the joints uh, to think about preserving more space for a true separation of church and state. Not just because some people like Jefferson thought so, but because religious people also thought so. That this was, separation of church and state, was the very best way to protect religion from government, as well as to protect others from the vicissitudes of sectarian impulses um, and how that can tear us apart. So this case, um, ostensibly just about straight knees and a little bit of money and, and, and a program um, with respect to playground, um, uh, rubberized playground um, uh, materials, uh, portends something really serious, I believe, which is the death of the notion that the Establishment Clause prohibits states from creating more of a buffer zone with respect to these things, number one. And number two, as Professor Marcus has said, uh, inviting the argument that it's constitutionally required to fund um, religious institutions where they, they possess certain secular characteristics, running schools, etc., 
um, and otherwise qualify for the money on uh, uh, neutral secular grounds. Step one, shrink the establishment clause. Step two, expand the free exercise clause. Inevitably shrink the discretion of the states. Now there's the money. The, the, the religious institutions are entitled, constitutionally entitled to receive the money. If you think that's the end of it, it's not. Increasingly, the religious institutions, it's Joan of Arc without the flame. They want, because otherwise it's discrimination, to receive the money and to receive it minus the conditions that other recipients might have to observe, like non-discrimination. We're not there yet, but we're close. Um, uh, and there have been other cases in which religious entities have asked for exemption from the non-discrimination clauses. Now, I think that had someone said to me in the 1960s that the little plastic chairs that we sat on in Bible school um, could, should, must be paid for by the taxpayers of, that was in some Cedarburg, Kenosha, Madison, Eau Claire, etc. And I, just to make sure I wasn't crazy, I called my dad, who's 86, and I said, what do you think about this? And for what it's worth, the plural of anecdote is not data, I know it, um, but I have a little bit of Lutheran wind in my sails. And my dad said, that's crazy. That's crazy. That sounds wrong to me. That's how revocabularized we've become with respect to our sense of what's constitution permitted and what's disallowed. In this case, it looks like a small one, but if you read the amicus briefs or you watch the arc of what the advocates have been attempting to do, their explicit purpose is not just to knock down the wings, uh, but to remove this, this fig leaf of divertibility so that money can go directly into religious coffers. Last part is the, this is Missouri Synod is uh, one of the more conservative synods of the Lutheran Church. A dollar is a dollar. That's Economics 101, and the court has embraced it elsewhere. The buck they don't have to spend on the playground equipment enables them to spend it elsewhere. Heroes and hymnals and, and resources for um, uh, pastors, etc. And it's a good thing, too, that they are able to raise money and spend it on those, on those purposes. But the supplanting, make no mistake about it, and uh, Chief Justice Roberts noted this, if you give money to a terrorist organization for good ends, well, they could, those savings might be applied to other ends. I mean, they've seen this principle in operation elsewhere. But here they seem to suggest to us otherwise, and, 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 and then at the end chide us that it's odious to a free people that we would deny these monies to these kids in the playground. I submit that it's glorious to a free people that we would think about this and that all of us who inhabit a religious space would understand the difference between discrimination on the basis of religion and creating secular, non-sectarian space. Last point is when the Catholic movement, America Revised, when the Catholic schools were formed, um, it was in part in response to the following. It wasn't that the Bible wasn't taught in school, it's that a debate had erupted about which version of the Bible should be taught in school. The King James Version or another version? I mean, it, it, is, it is the idea that we, we romanticize uh, the sectarian energy and, and why our religious convictions are absolutely unique. Um, uh, and, and, and our relationship to religion is absolutely unique. I think it's, it's more powerful uh, and potentially, as Roger Williams understood, perhaps more corrosive of a public, of a public state. All things that are neutral are not hostile or bristling with hostility to religion. Um, uh, but as I said, the, the separation of church and state, that ship has sailed. And, and, um, and, and apparently, it's about to sail in Missouri, too. So let me ask the other panelists to, to respond to Dean of Sarah's comments. And I guess the large question is how much how much of a move did the court make here? Uh, is it as significant as uh, the dean just suggested? Um, fire away. Okay, well, I'm next in line, so I draw the bad straw. <laughs> but at least I feel free in knowing that I can pee on the carpet. Yeah. I'm going to answer the first question. And I think what I would like to do is pretend like I'm an academic, but I'm not really, but also provide what I think is a little bit of a judicial perspective of what's going on here. First, there is no reason to hang yourself, Professor Massaro, because 
this is not as bad as Everson, which is the first case that incorporated the Establishment Clause against the states and held it was nevertheless constitutional, as you know, to fund transportation for secular students to, to attend, or for parochial students to attend parochial school. I have a Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Ever since then, there's been this patchwork of cases that has no logical application in deciding this tension between the free exercise and, and the Establishment Clause. But Smith, well, Smith, and I appreciate so much of what uh, the Dean said, and it provides more insight into what my own thinking is, but Smith, I think, illustrates a problem, too, from the free exercise point of view. And even the way you presented the, the issue, Professor Marcus, suggests the problem, which is, there is a difference between not burdening free exercise and not finding that a statute doesn't burden free exercise. The young gentlemen, assuming that they were sincere in their need to smoke peyote, had their free exercise burden. But the, comp, but the court said free exercise is not going to extend that far. Many, many, many of my religious friends can point, all kind, point to all kinds of neutral religious laws that burden their free exercise. But nevertheless, are not violations of the free exercise clause. And so what I really think, and I think, uh, maybe a slightly different light, the one that I would agree with Dean Massaro on. What the court is really trying to do here is draw closer to a unified principle of the First Amendment, which it has tried in the past. And I actually think what was strongest about Judge, Justice Sotomayor's dissent is saying, look, we're never going to be able to do this. She doesn't exactly say that, but she kind of says, we're never going to be able to do this. We're going to always have these weird outliers, and they probably should be here. So we're not going to get these neutral principles of application. Uh, but if you're going to apply Smith to say, it doesn't matter if this violates your free, your right to free exercise because it is neutral, then it is fair to apply that on both sides of the flip. And I think that's what the court's thinking. My problem with that, both as it pertains to Smith and the Establishment Clause, is a little bit of a different one as it goes to how courts do things. And, and that is this. I think the court, and I think that this goes through almost all the cases, it's a theme that goes through almost all the cases we're going to discuss today. The court is at its worst when it tries to determine motives for why government does things. Because it is really impossible to determine motives, and I think the Blaine Amendment cases demonstrate that. There's a huge his history of discrimination that accompanies the Blaine Amendments. But it's also possible to look at a Blaine Amendment and if you didn't know that history, say, this is a perfectly logical way to implement the Establishment Clause in a practical application, and you could do that without any desire to discriminate at all. And so how is a court, if, if the intent with which the government does something has to be ascertained, really, how does a court do that? You know, we have the Lukumi Babuai case where, you know, they say you can't put your animals. And the court said, well, this is obviously uh, an attempt to discriminate against Santa Rita. Well, I think they're probably fairly safe on that, but really? I mean, if we had a slaughterhouse in the street, uh, a church slaughterhouse in the neighborhood, would, would that perhaps be different? In any case, I think that the, I think that courts in general, and it is a problem because, as Dean Massaro said, you can never really get away, uh, at least from some, in some civil rights cases and equal protection cases, even if there is neutral application of the laws, I think we would all acknowledge that those persons who are affected are entitled to have a government that acts neutrally towards them. But a court is very ill-equipped to determine motivations. And so it's very ill-equipped to determine motivations in Smith. It's very ill-equipped to even determine why the government acted when it enacted a blame and even though there is a history of discrimination. And so if you're going to balance those principles, I think the court is trying to do it on a neutral basis, which I think in the end won't be satisfactory to anybody. But I think that the patchwork cases that they've gone through isn't very satisfactory to the court. But the fact that Everson exists and so many other cases that I think are far more dangerous to establishment principles, which I think need to be observed for all the reasons Judge, or Dean Sarah talked about, uh, 
I don't think there's any necessarily any reason to hang ourselves because of Trinity Lutheran, because I don't think it is that big an outlier from the patchwork we already have. So the dean has a rebuttal, but maybe we can have the dean rebut everything. <laughs> so I'd like to hear from the professors. So. Um, well, so, so I, unlike uh, the dean and judge, I am unburdened by expert knowledge of First Amendment doctrine, so I, I, I get that qualifier. But so I approach this more. I'm a philosopher by training, and so I approach this, and this is how I sort of always thought about these religious religion clause cases. It's just trying to come up with like, what's a coherent framework. What are what are we what are we doing here that makes sense? And I think what the judge said in saying that what seems to be going on in Trinity Lutheran is this attempt to create a coherent framework. I think that's right. I think that's what the court is trying to do, and to have this sort of, okay, formal neutrality. That's the that's going to be our principle, both as to pre-exercise and as to establishment. Right, and that's a coherent picture. And which was one thing I wanted to ask uh, the dean. She painted this picture of sort of shrinking uh, establishment clause on the one hand and expanding pre-exercise clause on the other. And I wonder if, and maybe, is there at least a sort of tension or sort of pressure on this free exercise growth that comes out of a case like Trinity Luther, right? So even if we see the sort of shift towards formal neutrality in the establishment clause space, does that then put pressure on advocates of free exercise, not only as to neutral laws, but also seeking exempt, like ministerial exemption, these type of challenges, right? Exemptions from general uh, burdens. Uh, does this at least create some additional pressure on on sort of religious litigants in that free exercise space. I'd just be curious about your, your thoughts. Um, because more generally, and, and this goes a little bit, uh, uh, it, uh, Professor Marcus referenced this sort of uh, status activity distinction that the court relied on heavily. And I think what you see in the, so so I agree with Dean Basaro that right money is fungible, right? So a dollar spent here is a, or a, a dollar provided by the government here is a dollar the churches have to spend there. Uh, but at the same time, everyone also agrees that right, fire departments will go and put out a fire at the church. Right? No one thinks that's a violation of the establishment clause. Even though, of course, you know, if they had to supply their own private fire department, that would, that's money they, they, can, they can now spend on Bibles. Um, and so the question is, well, what kind of state funding is a problem and what kind is it? Right? So it's, well, we're trying to come up with some kind of line between what's, what's problematic and unproblematic state support. Um, and it, it, as best I can tell, I think there are sort of two ways one can go about trying to draw that line. One is to try to find some sort of qualitative difference between different types of funding, right? And so here, sort of, so one qualitative difference would be, okay, well, we make decisions based on status versus decisions based on activity, right? These are sort of logically different categories, and so that's the difference. Another, another qualitative distinction would be formal neutrality. Right? If, if it's formally neutral, then the spending is fine. If it's formally discriminatory, that's problematic. Um, and, 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 and as Professor Marcus gestured that I think a lot of these qualitative distinctions, like status activity, they seem a little hazy logically, uh, if you sort of really push down, which is why I think the court then is, is attracted to this formal neutrality criterion. right? Because that, I think, is, that does sort of hold, hold water. That criterion. So, so if you are inclined to go down this qualitative distinction uh, path, I think one finds a strong impulse towards this formal neutrality approach. Of course, you, you, but you don't have to go that route, right? You could also go more quantitative route and say, look, it's not about the type of support; it's just too much support, right? This is just not the kind of, you know, sort of small potato support that we're worried with. And you might think here, you know, fun, Fun to give it a few dollars for a playground, that's not that big of a deal, but more funding we find that problematic. Um, but my, my sense is that if one goes that more quantitative road, route, there that it's a lot squishier and there's a lot, in my mind, less law for the courts to apply, which then I, I would think would lead one towards, as you say, really expanding the play of the joints almost to, like, quite far to where the, either the states or the, or the Congress, where political actors have a lot of room to maneuver and the courts really shouldn't get involved. Um, but I guess my, my read on this, more as a philosopher, less as a drug panelist, is to think, well, if you want to go this sort of formal distinction, or if you want to go the substantive distinction between permissible and impermissible funding, you're going to find yourself at this formal neutrality criteria. Uh, or alternatively, if you want to go quantitative, then, you, then it becomes more of a political question. But again, that's my inexpert. So I'd be curious. Um, thank you. So uh, one thing that uh, sort of 
keep, one theme that keeps coming up here uh, is this theme of messiness, starting with the, uh, the analogy that, um, that uh, Professor Marcus made. Um, and I, it's funny because I actually am concerned that the court is not willing to get messy enough in this area. Um, and that's sort of my takeaway from this case. Uh, so I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, uh, Justice uh, Scalia and Justice Breyer used to go on this road show that was very popular. Um, and basically, they would start, they would talk about their, their, their ways of uh, approaching cases. And Justice Breyer um, would sort of put on this show where he'd say, you know, say what, what's it like to decide a case, Justice? And he would say, oh, it's agony. I would I stay up at night and I think about all these different things. There's so many different factors, and how do you balance them? And it's just, it's just agony on the bench, and, and we do our best, but oh gosh, it's so hard. And the Justice Scalia would sort of laugh and say, oh, because you're doing it wrong. It's so easy. Um, and that, is, uh, that, that actually tracks their ideological um, or their jurisprudential um, approaches to law. Um, or stated otherwise, um, there's sort of a, um, a theme or, or a trend that you can see. And, and I'll just say sort of the more of the world leading justices versus the more conservative leading justices, um, where the latter group tends to be very resistant to engaging in legal analysis that feels messy. Um, where, where you don't have, where you have uh, uh, minds that aren't clean, um, where there's uh, cases on the margin that, that are very difficult, um, that tends to concern them. It starts to make them feel more like there's, that uh, the judges are legislating from the bench. Um, and by contrast, more liberal leaning justices uh, tend to be more comfortable with that, for better or for worse. Um, the, the point to bringing this all up is that when you have a free exercise clause on the one hand, and you have the Establishment Clause on the other hand, the analysis is necessarily going to be messy. Um, the uh, analogy that I'll use right now is silly, and, and the dean is sure that it's sort of faint when she hears it. But um, it's almost like you have a coach, you say to the coach, um, hey coach, there are a bunch of players on your team, there, there are a few players on your team, and you can't play them too much, because you don't want to be seeming like you're endorsing them. But you can't play them too little, because you can't be seeming like you're disapproving of them. And by the way, when they're out there, they have to follow some of the rules, but not all of the rules, and just, you know, good luck with that coach, just go for it. Um, and if you can imagine, I mean, that's an incredibly difficult thing for the coach that have to have to balance. And the analogy here would be the government is trying to figure out how to interact with all its different constituents, including churches and religious entities. Um, and in doing that, it's necessarily going to be messy. So what does a court do in policing the government? It could do one of three things, in my mind. It could, number one, say, you know, we're going to have kind of a hands-off approach. This is tough. Go for it, government. Do, do your best, and we'll police it, but we're going to give you a hands-off approach. That's the play in the jo joints approach, the idea that there's some room between what the uh, free exercise clause prohibits and what the establishment clause, uh, uh, what it prohibits, right? Um, that's one approach. The second approach is to say, you know, we're not going to give the government that play in the joints. In which case, I would say that the court has to get messy. It's going to have to start drawing lines that feel arbitrary, um, because otherwise, you get to the third approach, which is that the court can basically say, you know what, we're going to care more about the establishment clause, or we're going to care more about the free exercise clause, and we're going to sacrifice the other one in the interest to make lines clean and analysis clean. Um, and so, in this case, uh, I feel like one of the concerns the court is not allowing the play in the joints in the same way. But it's also seeming to be kind of resistant to getting messy. And I would say that for three reasons. Um, there's, three re there's three ways that the court could get messy here and, and continue to police this line while not allowing the play in the jo joints. One is this use versus uh, status distinction that justice, um, that the chief suggests, right? And the idea is you know, essentially that um, you need to be uh, officially neutral when it comes to the status of the people or entities regulating, but not with respect to how you regulate what they're doing. Okay? That's one way of, of it's messy, it's messy, and that's what Chief, uh, that's what Justice Gorsuch says in his concurrence. He says, this is a mess. How could that possibly be? To which my response is, this is law, right? And when you go to law school, the first thing you learn is how messy it is. Um, the second thing you, right, the second thing uh, that you might do is to say, look, plague pea gravel and tire replacement of pea gravel is just different than funding um, the education of somebody who wants to be ordained as a minister, right? Funding that religious or, uh, education. It's just different than uh, building the pews. Um, and while you then have someone like the dean accurately saying, hey, look, money is fungible, the response to that is, yes, this is messy, but we have to police the line somehow. Uh, a third way of uh, policing the line would be to say, yeah, we're going to look at this facially neutral. We're going to approach it with this uh, facial neutrality idea, but we're going to be willing to look at intent. 
And so if the, the, we have jurisdictions that start engaging in shenanigans where they're trying to favor certain religions and they're running it through neutral language, we're going to look behind it. But Judge Snow is far from alone in being very resistant to looking aggressively at uh, the intent behind legislation. Um, in response to those three things, we have a concurrence by um, Justice Gorsuch and Justice Thomas saying that they disapprove of the first line drawing, they disapprove of the second line drawing, and I think it's telling that the, that the Chief Justice does not talk about the Blaine Amendments in here. That, to me, signals that they don't want to talk about intent. And so this is a long way of saying that I don't know that I find the outcome in this case to be as troubling as, for example, um, the dean does or, or uh, uh, Professor Marcus does. Um, but what I do find troubling is the, that the idea that the court may be trying to break down certain uh, lines, maybe trying to get rid of this playing the joints, but then not willing to continue to police it in order to make sure that we have both an effective establishment clause and an effective uh, reactionist clause. OK, so I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative to extend the session to uh, 145 which doesn't permit time for audience questions, I apologize, but it does give the Dean a chance for her rapier-like rebuttal. And the big question, I think, that comes from this panel is, do, do we need a coherent framework for the First Amendment, or can we have some messiness? Can we have the court articulate some bright line rules that may not have a lot of theoretical coherence, but at least provide enough guidance to preserve that sort of middle ground that you prefer? Well, that's a big, that's a meta question. Good, you get two minutes to answer it. <laughs> I agree with Professor Mannheim. If this is something that, that courts are unable to do, then uh, they, they, how can they figure out proximate cause? How can, I mean, it's a constant endeavor, a matter of degree, um, and I know that they may be apprehensive about it, and I know it's au courant to say, you know, we, pre we prefer to get away from balancing tests, um, and formalism is the way to go, and that ostensibly reduces judicial power. But it, 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 what they did here is, um, first, it didn't reduce judicial power. It strikes down the law of Missouri and a, and a significant number of other jurisdictions as a matter of federal edict. Maybe it did so with a bright line test. Second, um, uh, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with the, 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 the gravity of prior cases um, uh, that have already, that ship has sailed, as I said, in terms of the amount of resources that already are flowing and can flow. Uh, to religious destinations. Absolutely. Keep your eye on the ball. If this is something to which you object, it's, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars in Oregon revenue um, in all kinds of ways. And Justice O'Connor was particularly eloquent about that in the Establishment Clause cases. Um, but I'm just making an observation about where this is ending up. And the unbearable lightness of burden is part of it. We don't want to analyze how big of a burden it is. And therefore, having to send a form to the government yeah, this is the Little Sisters of the Poor case, is a sufficient burden um, uh, in order to get an exemption from the mandate of providing contraception for their employees. It was merely sending in the form. Um, and, and this is not, not an analysis that applies in every area. This, this uh, it, it, for example, the allowing a small burden to trigger the whole trap, the whole apparatus. Um, they make distinctions about burdens in the free speech area that are more fine-tuned. Um, um, with respect to the free exercise clause, we had a clearer test. It was, it was written by Justice Scalia, and right and left didn't like it because they felt it was insufficiently attentive to uh, free exercise values. Um, it's now muddier than it was before um, this opinion. Um, and uh, is this step smaller than Everson? Yes and no. Yes, in terms of the money, perhaps, that, that is at stake here, but no in the sense that this is a direct amount of money from the state to a religious institution as such. And would there have been ways that they could have done this to achieve the same effect? You know, so that this is a small step in the greater scheme of things? Yes, that's my point. It's been happening, drip, 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 drip. Um, when you listen to this war on Christmas, or the godless secular court, I don't know what you're talking about. You, the mythical sort of, I don't know who you are, right? Um, but the, the clear pattern of the court especially since 2002, has been shrinking establishment, expanding uh, free exercise um, uh, uh, in these recent cases. And the next one, mark my words, mark me, uh, as, as the character says, and it doesn't matter, will be a greater exemption from the generally applicable non-discrimination uh, conditions on the money. And it will take time for that complete revolution to be completed. It's a conscious strategy. And the court's aware of it, the litigants are aware of it, the amicus briefs were aware of it, 
And again, it's built on an assumption that this is all like equal protection. It's not. It's not. Everybody inhabits a relationship to religion. Um, and we might decide we're safer um, with separation of church and state than other alternatives. The Supreme Court has decided otherwise. Direct money to religious institutions is increasingly not just allowed, but required. Yes, I think a lawyer would be, would be foolish not to look at this case as a victory on the side of religious free exercise of religion claims being more robust. In fact, they've already, the websites are afire with it. Well, uh, let's move on to another case that makes others of us a fire. Uh, but before we do that, I'd like everyone to stand up and just stretch for two seconds, and we'll get, we'll reconvene. Don't move, just up and down. Okay, this is a professor's trip for an hour and a half class. All right. Okay. Thank you. I also just like to make people move when I say so. Um, okay, we are going to move on to our second case uh, for the afternoon. Uh, another case decided this past term. Uh, this is a case called Ziegler versus Abbasi. Uh, Ziegler versus Abbasi addresses the right of Muslim immigrants detained in the wake of 9-11 to bring a Bivens claim against federal officials and thereby seek damages resulting from uh, unconstitutional conditions of confinement. Uh, the best place to start is, of course, the wonderful scene from The Big Lebowski. Uh, that's redundant, of course. Every scene from The Big Lebowski is wonderful. Uh, here's the scene. The dude is supposed to pay ransom to several kidnappers who claim to be nihilists. He reports this to his friend Walter, who gravely whistles and says, nihilists. I mean, say what you want about the tenets of National Socialism, dude. At least it's an ethos. The court's treatment of Bivens in Ziegler versus Abbasi is as empty and harrowing as The Big Lebowski's nihilism. The court has fashioned reprehensible restrictions on the ability of civil rights plaintiffs to plead constitutional torts. The court has worked lamentable hurdles into the law of qualified immunity, further constraining those plaintiffs' rights to recover. But say what you want about the tenets of these doctrines, dude. At least they have an ethos. The court's treatment of Bivens in Ziegler versus Abbasi has no ethos, no theory, no policy, nothing. It's simply, to my mind, nothing but a diatribe against the Warren Court and William Brennan cloaked in the dulcet pros of Justice Kennedy. Here's the background. In the immediate wake of the 9-11 attacks, the FBI moved aggressively to arrest and detain anyone who might have a possible connection to terrorism. Ultimately, the FBI detained about 700 individuals um, on immigration charges and designated about 84 of these persons of interest. They were sent to a federal prison in Brooklyn, New York, and held uh, in solitary confinement. Now, the FBI's investigation was uh, fevered and cursory, uh, not surprisingly, um, in the wake of this attack. The uh, FBI was, was feverishly trying to prevent a future one. One person of interest held in solitary confinement was arrested when FBI officials discovered incriminating evidence at his apartment. This evidence consisted of a Time magazine with a picture of the Twin Towers on the cover, uh, and a notice from the INS that he report to uh, an, an office within one of the towers on September 11th to renew his work authorization. This person was on the way to the towers when the planes uh, uh, struck, and then he returned to his apartment. Uh, the individuals held as persons of interest in Brooklyn were subjected to harsh conditions of confinement, including beatings, food deprivation, sleep deprivation, solitary confinement for lengthy stretches, and repeated and frequent strip searches. Alleging that they were subjected to this mistreatment uh, solely because of their ethnicity and nationality and, and religion, the plaintiffs claimed that the defendants violated their constitutional rights under the due process uh, and equal protection components of the Fifth Amendment. These defendants included John Ashcroft, then the Attorney General, and Bob Mueller, uh, then the head of the FBI and future star of one of our Constitution Day episodes. They allegedly created the policy that led to the plaintiff's uh, 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 unconstitutional treatment. Um, the plaintiffs also included as defendants the warden and associate warden for executing the policy, this policy and allowing prison guards to mistreat them. Now this lawsuit bounced around quite a bit. In fact, the court encountered it before. In 2009, in Ashcroft versus Iqbal, the court ruled that the allegations in the plaintiff's complaint against Ashcroft and Mueller uh, did not plausibly state a claim upon which relief could be granted. The court reasoned in part that it needed to enforce a tighter pleading standard lest the case against the Attorney General and the FBI Director proceed to discovery and subject them to time-consuming, uh, burdensome litigation. The plaintiffs amended their complaint after the Iqbal decision, uh, which the Second Circuit ultimately upheld as stating the claim. The 2009 Iqbal decision uh, held that a complaint must be factually viable. It must contain sufficient factual detail to make it plausible 
that discovery will uncover evidence of, uh, to prove the allegations true at trial. But this is just one half of the pleading equation. A complaint must also contain legally viable allegations. Put differently, the plaintiffs must uh, allege a cause of action recognized under the law. Abbasi, Iqbal's evil twin, holds that the plaintiffs did not do so. To reach this holding, the Supreme Court gutted, uh, guts its Bivens, uh, Bivens doctrine. Now, Bivens is the famous 1971 decision in which the court allowed a plaintiff challenging unconstitutional conduct by federal officials to sue for damages. Bivens is the federal common law equivalent of 42 U.S.C. Section 1983, the Reconstruction Era statute that creates a cause of action for constitutional uh, torts against state and local officials. Justice Kennedy begins his discussion in Section 1983 as if to underscore the lack of equivalent statutory authorization for a Bivens claim, and thus to suggest that Bivens sprang out of nowhere. It, it's little more the court intimates than the legal effluence of liberal do-gooders like William Brennan and his bleeding heart fellow travelers. And this is nonsense. Plaintiffs have brought common law torts suits against federal officials since the founding. Whether federal officials acted unconstitutionally in injuring a plaintiff's uh, a right of an injuring a plaintiff got blended into these common law tort suits in a very confusing, uh, illogical way. Bivens straightened out this mush and in so doing offered a clearer, more sensible cause of action uh, to challenge federal official misconduct. Nonetheless, Justice Kennedy is correct to observe that over the last uh, several decades, the court has come to view Bivens with disfavor. Justice Kennedy stresses that when it comes to private rights of action, uh, to enforce statutes, the court has come to emphasize Congress's intent above all else. Kennedy argues that Bivens is inconsistent with the court's insistence that Congress, not the court, take the lead on creating rights of action. Because Congress has not recognized the cause of action for constitutional torts, the court should be very reluctant to allow plaintiffs to bring these suits. Kennedy's discussion of the court's implied private right of action jur jurisprudence is fatuous. When the substantive right the plaintiff claims is statutory, it exists by virtue of legislative grace. There's a strong separation of powers argument in favor of Congress's prerogative to determine whether a private right of action should exist to enforce the substantive right. But here, the substantive right exists in the Constitution. It doesn't exist due to legislative grace. Moreover, a right of action already exists to enforce the Fifth Amendment. As Justice Kennedy says time and again, the Abbasi plaintiffs could have sued for injunctive relief. So this case isn't really about the existence of a private right of action, but about the court's power to craft remedies to vindicate constitutional injuries. In other words, in other contexts, think the Fourth Amendment and, and suppression, the remedial analysis has nothing to do with congressional intent. Justice Kennedy obfuscates the important matter of judicial power to craft remedies, a complex and nuanced inquiry that begs for doctrinal clarification with a simplistic comparison to statutory rights of action. There's a lot more to say about all of this, but it's only constitutional foreplay. Let's move on to the opinion's climax. Now, I found over many years of Constitution Day, of presenting these cases, that nothing breaks the tedium so much as unnecessary <coughs> and sophomoric references to sex. So there you go. All right, we're halfway through. Kennedy tells us that Bivens' claims are disfavored, but he doesn't go so far as to jettison Bivens. So he still needs to go through the Bivens' analysis. When deciding whether a plaintiff can challenge unconstitutional conduct with a damages lawsuit, the court proceeds through three, through three steps. First, the court asks whether the case at issue involves a new context or whether it involves a Bivens claim that has already been recognized. Recall what the defendants, I'm sorry, what the plaintiffs alleged here, that federal officials subjected them to harsh conditions of confinement. In a case called Carlson versus Green, the court held that a prisoner in federal custody can bring a Bivens action to challenge the conditions of uh, his confinement. Isn't the bossy simply the same thing? Well, no, the court says. Justice Kennedy articulates a very precise, clear test to determine when a case presents something different than settled Bivens doctrine. Quote, if the case is different in a meaningful way from previous Bivens cases, then the context is new. Okay, that's very helpful. Kennedy rattles off a list of considerations to determine when differences are, quote, meaningful. These include just about everything you might imagine, uh, including whether the justice who wrote the previous decision likes different flavors of ice cream from the justice who's writing the current one. <clears throat> There's a pretty good argument that the claims against Ashcroft and Mueller are new because Carlson didn't involve high-level officials accused of setting unconstitutional policy as defendants. But the plaintiffs also sued the warden for allowing their mistreatment. This seems pretty close to Carlson. The court nonetheless insists that Abbasi presents a new context because Carlson involved the Eighth Amendment, and Bossie involves the Fifth Amendment. 
why these claims, both about conditions of confinement, differ, and why the difference is of constitutional significance goes unexplained. Now on to the second and third steps. Second, is there some sort of alternative remedy to protect the interest in question? And third, do special factors counsel hesitation before allowing a suit for damages to proceed? On the second step, Justice Kennedy repeatedly insists that the plaintiffs could have sued for an injunction or for a writ of habeas corpus. Now this argument is just silly. The plaintiffs were no longer detained by the time they sued. An injunction telling uh, the prison not to subject them to conditions of confinement would have been a little bit uh, late. As for habeas corpus, this is absurd. One of the allegations is that the federal officials did not permit their, uh, uh, the plaintiffs to meet with their lawyers. The heart of Kennedy's analysis lies with the special factors that counsel hesitation. Now, what is a special factor that counsels hesitation against recognizing a Bivens claim? Here is Justice Kennedy's definition, and I'm not kidding, I'm quoting. To be a special factor counseling hesitation, a factor must cause a court to hesitate before answering whether a Bivens claim ought to exist in the affirmative. In other words, to be a special factor counseling hesitation, something must be special and counsel hesitation. Here, Kennedy identifies several special claims, special factors that counsel hesitation. The case would require intrusive discovery into the acts and decisions that led to a policy's formulation. Liability might discourage future high-level officials from doing their duties. Discovery would intrude into sensitive matters, especially those involving national security. All of these considerations, indeed all of the arguments Kennedy advances for why there should not be a Bivens cause of action here, are accounted for by other doctrines. Justice Kennedy justified the heightened pleading standard adopted in his Ashcroft versus Iqbal decision based on the need to protect high-level officials from intrusive discovery as of a plausible basis to think that they engage in unconstitutional conduct. Qualified immunity doctrine does not allow suits to proceed against federal officials unless they violate clearly established rights. This doctrine ensures that only cases involving obvious breaches of constitutional rights can proceed, and it ensures that cases like this one, where murky trade-offs exist between individual rights and executive discretion, don't. I think the court has done significant damage to pleading and qualified immunity doctrine in its ardor to protect federal officials from civil litigation's intrusive reach, but at least these doctrines serve some plausible goals. Pleading doctrine tries to balance the cost of unwarranted litigation against the benefits of access to discovery, and qualified immunity doctrine is designed to enable constitutional rights to develop while ensuring officials do not get uh, discouraged from robust uh, energetic action. Given that these doctrines account for all of the justifications Justice Kennedy offers to gut Bivens and Abbasi, I'm left nearly speechless at the court's constitutional nihilism, although I've been speaking for 15 minutes, so that's not true. Um, the court is happy to destroy a decades-old constitutional remedy for, for what amounts to no reason whatsoever. The dude does not abide. Okay, I'm going to let Professor Mannheim uh, go first, because I've been trashing her former boss the last 12 minutes. What was that adjective you said that you used to describe the writing here? Dulcet. What does that mean? Kind of sweet and soft. Yeah, and nice, right. That's a compliment. Okay. Yeah, um, there's a compliment. There's a compliment. Okay, um, what do you think? Is, 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 does the court have overruled Bivens? Just reactions. So, uh, no, I don't think the court has overruled Bivens here. I think it's uh, taking some pains to say that it's not overruling Bivens. Uh, what the court is doing here. Okay, so, well, to back this up really quickly, essentially, one way of thinking about what a cause of action is is that if you want to sue in federal court, you need a cause of action. And that's just sort of, there you go, you need to find it somewhere. You need to find it, usually you try to find it in uh, a statute. Um, you might be able to find it uh, through some other means, but generally speaking, it's either you're gonna find it in the statute, or you look, you point straight to the Constitution, and you say there's something in the Constitution that says that I can sue for, for this claim. So it's sort of, it's, it gets you in the door. Um, so it's a big deal, you need, you need a cause of action. If you don't have a cause of action, your claim goes away. Um, you know, at some point you ask, how is this different from all these other doctrines, things like uh, qualified immunity, and one way of answering that is that if you don't have a cause of action, you just don't get in the door to begin with. You're not gonna, you're not gonna have a, a, a sort of anything at all on the merits. Um, so uh, what the court did was, um, decades ago, it concluded that plaintiffs in, in a certain circumstance can, can have a cause of action directly from the Constitution. So they don't need to point to a statute, um, and that was the Bivens case. And in the years after Bivens, um, the court found two other instances where it thought that the Constitution allowed a plaintiff a cause of action. And so that gave us three circumstances where the Supreme Court found a 
cause of action existed. Um, the first was in um, sort of routine law enforcement and particularly in the search and seizure context. So for example, if uh, FBI agents break down your door in an unconstitutional way, you can sue for damages. Um, the second was um, sex discrimination in the employment law context. Um, and then the third was if prison, if federal prison officials um, uh, mistreat you in some way. Okay, so those are the three areas. Then what happened, in a sense, was that the composition of the court changed, and the court, as it was newly constituted, didn't really agree with the idea that you can have these sorts of causes of action coming directly from the Constitution. And so it started saying no to basically every, single, every future plaintiff. Every time a plaintiff came in and said, hey, look at those three cases. I don't want to bring a claim in another context. The court said no. It said no and no and no and no and no. And there's like a dozen cases or something at this point with the court saying no. And Abbasi is the you know is the twelfth. Um, and each time, what they've said, the court has said is this is a new context. It's not one of these first three contexts. Um, and and for various reasons, we're going to conclude that that we should not let you have a cause of action in this new context. That's what Abbasi is also doing. Um, so what is the outcome? What, what, what is the world that we have now post Abbasi? I think it's the same world we had pre Abbasi. It's just the court is again confirming that it's not, it doesn't agree with those old precedents. It's not going to overrule them. And so if you want to have a cause of action against federal officials for damages, you better find a statute or it better be in one of those three circumstances from decades ago. I'll let the other panels come on. We don't have to go down the order, but Ryan, uh, Professor, I mean, go right ahead. Sure, I'll So, so Professor Marcus emphasized, you know, this isn't just some statutory right we're talking about, right? This is the Constitution, uh, constitutional rights. But I, I, I do want to emphasize just first, I think as a threshold matter, I think just as Kennedy's opinion fails, largely just as a matter of statutory interpretation. Um, and so I think it, it, it's, it's important to sort of emphasize. So, so Justice Kennedy makes a, a big fuss about, look, Congress has created a statute, Section 1983, that exempt that subjects state and local officials to individual personal liability for constitutional violations, right? There's no, but there's no reference to federal officials, right? So seemingly, just Kennedy thinks, well, if Congress wanted to subject federal officials to similar liability, they could do that. They haven't done that. The problem with that analysis, as Justice Breyer notes in his dissent, right? So Section 1983 isn't the only relevant statute here. Uh, there's also something called the Federal Court Claims Act that subjects the federal government as such to liability for uh, tort violations. Right? So you can sue the federal government as such for, for tort violations. Uh, but then there's something else called the Westfall Act that says, well, what you can't do is sue individual uh, government actors. Right? So the Westfall Act says, look, the FTCA, is, that's the only place you can go for money for, for, to sue uh, the federal government for, for tort actions. Now, importantly, the Westfall Act uh, specifically exempts two types of claims. It says, look, uh, federal officials remain liable, federal individual officials remain liable for uh, actions for constitutional violations or other statutory violations. Right? So just as Breyer points out in his dissent, I think it's a very fair reading of the Westfall Act specifically exempting actions for constitutional violations as it's essentially congressional ratification of Bivens, of Bivens type actions. And so, so again, so if Justice, if, so if, if Justice Kennedy says, look, well, we just need to engage in sort of rigorous textual analysis of you know, the, the, both the constitutional and statutory text, I think he just fails uh, here in just failing to recognize that, look, Congress has done exactly what he said they need to do. Right? Justice Kennedy says, look, if Congress wants to add federal officials to Section 1983, they can do that. But in response, right, Congress can say, why do we have to do that? We have already, we've already endorsed Bivens in the Westfall Act. Um, I think there are interesting questions about whether Congress could fail to provide uh, liability, whether, whether Congress could uh, give some strict immunity for individuals for constitutional violations. I think those are interesting, difficult constitutional questions. But I don't think we're confronted with those here, because I think Congress has provided uh, at least pre Abbasi, seemingly have provided an endorsement of Bivens by a statute. So look, if, if I can just interrupt and ask the professors, uh, there, there, one could argue about, it's a very interesting and complex problem of trying to understand the, the statutory framework here. <coughs> You've got a, a, a statute, 42 U.S.C. section 1983, that has come to mean this, this sort of robust 
cause of action against state and local officials, but that's, of course, something that only happens in, in the 1960s, and the statute's on the books since the Reconstruction, only in the 60s gets invigorated. There's this complex regime that gets amended and adjusted in the 1970s and 80s, the, the Federal Tort Claims Act, Westfall Act. But here's my an underlying question. Should Congress, when, it, when it's, a con it's a constitutional claim, should Congress have the on-off switch? Just why should Congress, what, what makes it appropriate for Congress to control rights of action? Why, why shouldn't the court, uh, have, as part of its power to interpret the Constitution, have the power to, to recognize class action? Why, why does Congress matter in this regard? This is to the, he was responding to the okay. president. Okay. Okay. Um, so I think there are two uh, sort of questions embedded in that. Um, and the first question is, um, should Congress be able to have input into how these causes of action look? And the second question, which is the one that um, uh, Professor Dorfler uh, raised, is, does, is Congress under, is, does the Constitution allow Congress to decide to not give any cause of action at all? Um, when it comes to the first set of questions, um, in my mind this is kind of analogous to uh, the considerations you get when you have uh, prudential um, procedural rulings, where the way I think about it is that the court, in a sense, feels like when it comes to some sort of right or some sort of procedure or the like, um, there's different ways of providing it. You know, maybe maybe the, the court could provide a procedure A or procedure B or procedure C, and as long as one of those procedures is provided, then the Constitution is happy with it. And what Congress gets to do is decide whether it's A, B, or C. And so if that's what we're talking about here, I'm not sure that that has the same constitutional uh, problems uh, that the other set of questions has. Um, and so if we're in the first world, then, then basically one of the questions we have to start asking now is things like what exactly does the Westfall Act preclude, um, which the Supreme Court I don't think has, has squarely answered that question. Um, and and uh, as a related matter, you know, what can a plaintiff do if the plaintiff has gotten an injury uh, related to this sort of constitutional violation? Um, and if the answer is the plaintiff has nothing, the plaintiff has no recourse, and the reason why the plaintiff has no recourse is because of what Congress wants, well, then we're in the second world where the question is, can Congress uh, just take totally take away remedies uh, from people for, for, for harm associated with constitutional violations? If we're in that world, that's a very difficult question to answer. The court has not answered it. Um, and one of the problems with the Abbasi opinion, which I believe that you flagged and you as well, um, is uh, that it kind of implicitly suggests that maybe we're in that world where there's no remedy, in which case that difficult constitutional question is presented, but it hasn't really been grappled with in this case. Yeah, I mean, as, it, it, as, as Professor Manning says, I think this is a really hard question. I don't, I don't know quite what I think, but if I was to sort of think cues that, that suggest that Congress has the freedom to do that would be, I think the, the clearest cue in the Constitution is probably the suspension clause that puts express constraints on Congress' ability to withdraw a particular remedy, namely in habeas corpus. And so I think a natural sort of negative implication of the suspension clause would be that as to other remedies, Congress has, has, has uh, I think, can do what it wants, given the necessary proper laws. Like if Congress or Congress sort of authority to effectuate what laws are necessary proper to carry the effect of power strength. Uh, Judge Snow? You, you made this decision as a district judge. Does it does it tell you no more Bivens claims? Well, no. <laughs> um, and the reason why, though, I, I want to say I have a tendency to one of my favorite. I, I know this quirky humor, but at Christmas time on Saturday Night Live, Keenan Thompson does a character called Everybody Gets Something Claus. <laughs> and what he does is he's a Santa Claus who goes and he gets people money and more engaged in various acts of debauchery because otherwise they're not going to get anything for Christmas. I think it's tremendously funny. And when I read Justice Kennedy's opinions, I think he's Everybody Gets Something Claus. Uh, he gives something to everybody. He tries to do it in his opinion. And he tries to do it in enough of a way that I think, in fact, this will prove to be a very it won't be as big an opinion as uh, as it reads. It has to be a big opinion. It's just we've selected it for Constitution Day. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, if I can offer a couple of thoughts on that. Uh, he, one of the things that he does to give district courts something is he writes in a way suggesting that there's never going to be any other kind of Bivens cause of action. And as you've suggested, he lays out a very lot 
very large number of categories that might suggest that you shouldn't recognize any Bivens cause of action. And then, in this case, he offers a particular example, which I think is so unpersuasive as to be ridiculous. You touched on it a little bit, but let me give it a little bit more flavor. In the federal courts in Arizona, we have so many petitions that come from prisons arguing that the constitutional right against cruel and unusual punishment has been violated. We get an equal, not an equal, but almost an equal number of petitions that come not from prisons, but come from county jails, because they come from people who are being incarcerated prior to trial. Okay? And they also argue that, they, that their cruel and unusual punishment pro, uh, protections are being violated. Well, for those of you who aren't lawyers, if you've already been convicted, it amounts to an Eighth Amendment violation because that's punishment. You're not being punished. I know this sounds silly, but you're not, for purposes of the Constitution, being punished if you're incarcerated before your conviction. That just involves your due process rights that you're entitled to before a conviction. And so, virtually every case that is, and I mean, I could cite probably hundreds that say, Yes, as a practical legal matter, if the petition comes out of a county jail filed by somebody who has not yet been convicted, it's a Fifth Amendment violation allegation, even if they're pleading as an Eighth Amendment violation. But if it comes for somebody who's already been convicted and is hence in a state or a federal penitentiary, then it is an Eighth Amendment violation. But the courts apply the same standards to both. Now, Justice Kennedy draws that distinction and he suggests that it might be a significant enough distinction to recognize no Bivens cause of action if it comes out of a pre-incarceration detention. I will tell you that I honestly believe that for any district court judge who, had, who has sat for any amount of time, that is such a ridiculous suggestion. That, that ridiculous is a harsh word. but. And I'm sorry, Justice Kennedy, because he really does try to take into account all of the different factors that, that, and there are some difficult factors, and there's some good reasons that he wrote the decision the way he did in some instances. But when you push the decision that far to suggest that that is a meaningful distinction, which would, which should mean that federal employees should get away with gross violations of constitutional rights merely because it's pre-incarceration or pre-sentence incarceration rather than post-incarceration, and that they're going to have to wait around until they actually get convicted before they're going to have any sort of federal remedy, is completely unpersuasive. And because, in his nicety, and, and in the everybody gets something clause, he returns this to the, federal, to the lower federal courts to make these kinds of evaluations, I think they're going to be very fact-driven. And I think it's going to be very, very hard for a federal district court or a federal court of appeals that sees very pronounced constitutional violations to find that special conditions prevail that suggest that Bivens action shouldn't prevail. Uh, let's let's say we have five more minutes, and then we so then we can uh, have a good ten minutes to uh, uh, to, to get some comments from the, the rest of the of us. Here. Well, it's it's a very general observation. Everybody has an intuition that where there's a, a, a wrong, there's a right. And I think that that sense is, is at, its, at its highest when it's a constitutional grievance. And I think my reaction to this is less about does this change uh, circumscribe Bivens a lot um, or some. Um, my sense is the reason that the opinion's wrong is because of the reasons that the court gave for creating Bivens in the first place. In other words, that, that it makes good sense to have uh, this kind of a remedy for violations of federal of constitutional rights by federal actors. 42 U.S.C. Section 1983, which provides for the remedy for the states, um, it makes more sense to me to look for an express statute and maybe even to construe it somewhat narrowly. Because you don't just have the potential separation of powers problem, but additionally you have a huge federalism problem. And, uh, and you have this radical reconstruction of the Constitution after the Civil War um, uh, for the first time extending um, uh, uh, the due process uh, protection and equal protection to no state shall, and gives in Section 5 of the 14th Amendment the right of Congress uh, to enforce those provisions. So they come out of different histories and different problems. Um, uh, but the idea 
that, that the court should be defer to Congress uh, with respect to whether Congress decides to provide a remedy for a particularly powerless and marginalized people uh, strikes me as the wrong way of approaching it in the first place. Um, and in any event, as you pointed out, they are saying, well, you've got this injunctive relief as, as, if that is, as useless as that is in some context. But injunctive relief is extraordinary relief. You're supposed to exhaust your legal remedies first, right? And, and damages is sort of the first line of attack, not, not the last line of attack. Um, and in any event, where it works, I would think that if you're worried about separation of powers, an injunction is way more invasive um, of, of, of the executive branch or uh, other branches of government's autonomy um, uh, than would be a damage action where there's some clarity after the fact and figure out what happened. And plus then immunity can kick in and any other number of ways of cabinet the impact of providing for a pivot's cause of action. Uh, habeas is no answer for all the reasons that, that have been given. Um, I, I'm a Justice Kennedy fan, um, uh, where people find him enigmatic and equivocal. I often think he's in, in a decent way trying to juggle uh, competing principles in a way that, that I really respect and admire. Um, but I thought this, this opinion, uh, I wouldn't say it stunk of the lamp, um, uh, but I think that it's a, it's a, bad, a bad path they're on with respect to clipping the wings of Bivens and uh, giving people very little recourse in cases of truly outrageous government uh, misconduct. So very quickly before I open it up, um, no one has engaged with the Big Lebowski metaphor that took me hours to draw. <laughs> yeah, I worked on this one for, for days on end. Uh, and, and so I just want to ask, what's, what's, what's the difference between the, two, the following two scenarios? One is to have a bit of cause of action any time the edit plaintiff alleges that a constitutional right has been violated by a federal legal official. The plaintiff must meet the plausibility pleading threshold because we want to make sure that people don't file lawsuits willy-nilly and thereby intrude upon uh, uh, executive branch decision making, weigh executive officials with uh, burdensome litigation alike. But we, the plaintiff has to meet that plausibility pleading threshold and the plaintiff has to show that the federal official uh, first a legend and show that the federal legal, the federal official uh, violated clearly established rights that the federal official, like any reasonable official, would have known about uh, at the time of the violation. So anyone can bring up, there's, there's no cause of action analysis whatsoever. You simply sue, and then there's, you meet the plausibility plea threshold, you get to prove, show, reasonably established, and then, I'm sorry, um, clearly established, and then you get to go to trial. That's one scenario. The other scenario is, we have this silly kind of, well, you can have it in this context, but not this context. There's a cause of action here, not a cause of action there. And then we're going to have the plausibility pleading threshold and qualified immunity. In terms of outcomes, what's the difference? Is there a difference in, from scenario one, scenario two, in terms of when government officials get saddled with the kind of burden that we don't want to saddle with them with, when, dam when officials are forced to pay damages when they shouldn't, shouldn't do so? That's what I want to respond to. Um, yeah, I think so. I don't get the reference to the movie. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's oh my gosh. So I, I think um, I think what I'm about to say is an answer to your question. Um, imagine a, a scenario where you have a, a teenage boy who is um, at the border between the United States and Mexico. And there's a U.S. border agent, and um, while well, this boy is this boy is basically a, a playing with his friends, um, and he's at a point in the border where there's not a you know there's not a wall um, or a fence; it's sort of open, and the boy is going back and forth across the border, um, and the U.S. border agent shoots and kills the boy while he is in Mex in Mexico. This is a this, this boy is a, a Mexican national. Um, so if the parents of this boy then sue the agent who shot him. Um, the agent can try to make a qualified immunity defense, uh, where he basically says, look, I can only be held uh, liable for damages if it was clearly established that I violated this person's constitutional rights. What is the clearly established constitutional right that I violated? And the boy's parents say, well, it's the Fifth Amendment due process, right? It's sort of a, a, an idea that he's been sort of punished before conviction. Um, and in response, the agent says, well, no, uh, it's not clear that someone like that has Fifth Amendment rights it's because he's, he's not American, he's Mexican, and um, he was shot in Mexico, not in the United States. Um, the answer to that is, yeah, maybe actually that person does have qualified immunity, doesn't have to pay damages. However, if the agent didn't know 
that he was in Mexico, right, because the border's open, number one, and number two, didn't know that he wasn't an American citizen, then there's a probably correct and certainly a good argument that that agent does not receive qualified immunity because, well, if somebody who knew it maybe can't be held responsible for not understanding whether the law allowed to do that, if the agent didn't realize that those um, sort of differences were there, then the agent probably can't avail himself of qualified immunity defense. Um, in that case, the boy's parents might be able to get damages unless there's no cause of action. In which case, you don't have to have that qualified immunity, qualified immunity analysis. Rather, you just ask, look, can we extend Bivens to a context where it's, it's at the border and this person is not an American citizen, not an American soil? Um, before you think this is a crazy hypothetical, uh, this is the Fernandez case, which the court decided a week after um, this Abbasi case. And what it did was it basically granted cert um, and told the Fifth Circuit, we think you probably erred when it came to the qualified immunity analysis, but take it back and do a business analysis. Uh, the only other point I'd make, and I think I'm sort of spinning off of Professor Mannheim's stat, and that is this. As a practical matter, qualified immunity frequently arises. There are factual issues in the terms of a qualified immunity debate. So if you're just trying to say a government official is not going to have to defend themselves at all, well, you don't. I mean, even though you're supposed to decide qualified immunity early on, sometimes the pleadings in a 1983 or a Bivens case are so different that there's going to have to be discovery. So if it doesn't, if you can't get rid of it on an Iqbal basis, qualified immunity is not necessarily going to quickly eliminate a lawsuit against a high-level government official if the pleadings are correct. Well, it doesn't, but that's my point. That's my question. If Iqbal says there's got to be enough specificity in the complaint to suggest if that's plausible, the plaintiff can find evidence in discovery to prove that the allegation is true. Then, should isn't that an argument for having that discovery and then letting this? Sure, pass sure. Up? But if you're Justice Kennedy, uh -huh. don't you say that? Well, if I really want to let these high-level government officials off the hook, yeah. then qualified immunity is not going to serve that purpose because they're going to be on the hook for discovery. And I think one of the things he wants to do. And I think it is more defensible on the level of high, these high-level government officials is let them off the hook of very burdensome lawsuits that can be brought by hundreds and thousands of people across the nation when qualified immunity is not going to be the answer. Okay. Questions, comments from the assembled masses? Yes. I'll be first. Um, there's plenty of talk about federal uh, agents in federal government. Um, how would the Constitution apply to state government, state agencies, uh, with respect to Arizona? The rights of the, the citizens, if their constitutional rights are violated by a state agency or a state government entity. You'll have to forgive us because we've been speaking in a lot of legal speak here, but you may have heard us talking about a 1983 action. And a 1983 action is a, it refers to a specific federal law. And the federal law authorizes people to bring lawsuits against state officials for damages if they've violated somebody's federal constitutional rights or, or rights that arise even under federal law. So, for example, if you are a citizen of Arizona and you believe that an Arizona government official acting under what they call the legal terms under the color of state law, <clears throat> has violated your federal rights, not even just your constitutional rights, then you're authorized to bring a damages action under Section 1983 of the federal law. And what this, what this, what Bivens, the, the, there's a, there's an uh, asymmetry between those instances when you have a cause of action to a state and local official, and those when you have a cause of action to a federal official for precisely the same conduct. You can much more latitude in the state context than the federal context because of uh, 1983. Other questions? Are we allowed to ask questions about the prior case? Sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I really feel like a puppy uh, in this one because I know nothing about this area of law. But when I speak with people practically about these issues, with the church that I go to, for instance, with people that I do political work with, about funding for uh, uh, church parking lots or, 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 or church uh, community centers. The, the refrain always is from lay people, 
Why don't, if, if, if churches are, are allowed now to be um, receiving public funding for various things, why are they exempted from property taxes? So my question is, how does that interplay with the establishment clause? Does that ever come up? Is that ever, because practically speaking, lay people mention it all the time. Sort of what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Do they have anything to do with one another, or are they completely separate? <laughs> yes. <laughs> they do have, no, they, they're, oh, sorry, they're not completely separate. They have a lot to do with each other, and it's really what I think uh, it's, it's a long and intricate line of cases, and, and, and that was, um, I think, the, the, the important point that Judge Snow made, and it's in disarray. Um, yeah, there, there's, uh, to what extent is the provision of certain tax exemptions available for religious institutions <coughs> Remember Rika Hoff, our tax colleague, um, at the time that she died, um, her opus uh, was that she was going to document and display and write a, a terrific article about the degree to which there are all these ways in which religious institutions are benefiting mightily from all kinds of uh, tax exemption, et cetera, um, and ways in which they're, they're boosted. Um, and it's not, and, it, and, then, and then pointing out the inconsistencies between when they are and when they aren't. Um, but, but did Trinity Lutheran, could that be a crack? Could that be um, an entryway for people who are interested in having churches pay their own way? I think that goes to the question that was, that they were, they were you know, why are you saying I shouldn't go hang myself? One, it's wrong. <laughs> but second, maybe this case isn't doing that much. No, I think the answer is we'll see, and a good lawyer would, would use this case the day after just to, to begin to, to attack these things, um, where there any case in which there's been a denial of equal treatment in, a, in an otherwise secular program where benefits flow to other destinations, and there's an exemption from that benefit flowing uh, to a religious institution, or that everybody else has to pay except for the religious institution. You know, either way, facially, it, it, it now looks to me like the court would think that it's potentially uh, discriminatory, non-neutral, something that can't be attacked. But and, and one of the things the case does, I think, in a way that you're suggesting beautifully well, is highlight. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> highlight the real problems that you get into here that are subject to varying characterizations under the same facts. So for example, under the Smith rule, if, if government has a neutral non-religious purpose for passing a law, then the fact that it inhibits your free exercise means that you have to comply, comply with the law. So income tax or taxation is a neutral government purpose. Then why should churches be exempt from income tax? Except for the fact that government has also recognized in certain instances that charitable nonprofit institutions are all exempt from income tax. So then the question is, well, do we consider a church a charitable nonprofit institution? And should it be exempt from income tax like other charitable non-topic or uh, whatever, institutions <laughs> are exempt from income tax. And so what really that turns down to is a very different people will see that in a very different light. And it does highlight the real problem. I mean, and so if you're going to say, as it did, that you cannot discriminate against a church as a recipient of government benefits, then that does, I think, highlight the, in, highlight the tax question in a more real way. One of the things that Just, Justice Sotomayor does, I think, pretty well in the dissent, is she acknowledges some areas where religion should be treated differently and has received benefits that she doesn't contest. But the problem is, once you start conceding that, this whole idea that, at least I think, the majority is trying to set up of kind of deciding these cases on neutral principles flies out the window. Oh, oh, we're going to have to, we're, we're at our time to take a break, although I'm sure the panelists, I will hand out the panelists' personal cell phones. We're slated to take a break until 2.45, and at that point we will reconvene to discuss 
Uh, not, not two recent decisions, but uh, uh, stuff coming down the court pipe. Uh, so, uh, so please uh, uh, come back here at 2.45 and we'll start from there. So we are doing something a little bit different from what we've done in years past. We have on occasion in the past discussed a case that has not yet been decided by the Supreme Court that we anticipate, that we, we've anticipated would make it its way to the court. Um, uh, but what we haven't done, uh, we have, what we haven't done is, is something that we're doing this afternoon. We're going to talk about the obstruction of justice uh, uh, investigation that's currently pending. Uh, that, there's no case there at all uh, uh, for the court to, to deal with, at least not at the moment. Um, the, what we're going to talk about now, though, is the, the litigation involving executive orders. This is something that the lower courts have been grappling with and uh, will go to the Supreme Court. So it's, it's sort of, a, it's not a court decision yet. Uh, but it's, it soon will be. Uh, and then we'll, we'll switch over to the obstruction of justice uh, episode for our last conversation. Uh, there's a lot of controversy over exactly which phrase to use to refer to the executive orders that prompted the litigation we'll discuss now. On June 5th, 2017, the president indicated in a tweet that he preferred the term travel ban. Uh, and of course, the tweets are all important, so I'm going to use the term travel ban. Now, the travel ban litigation is complicated in every conceivable way. It's complicated as a matter of substantive law, it's complicated procedurally, and of course it's complicated politically. I'm going to do my best to explain where we are in the litigation, just the posture of the litigation, before introducing the substantive legal theories that the parties have raised. On January 27, 2017, President Trump issued an executive order that banned the entry of persons from Iraq, Iran, Libya, uh, Syria, Somalia, Sudan, and Yemen for 90 days, regardless of uh, immigration status. The order suspended the American Refugee Resettlement Program for 120 days, and it suspended the entry of Syrian refugees indefinitely. These decisions were undertaken to accomplish two objectives, uh, according to the order. First, the Department of Homeland Security would use the suspension uh, to study screening procedures and ensure that they adequately protect Americans from the threat of terrorism. And second, the Secretary of State would give countries that provide inadequate information about their nationals to American consular officials two months to get their acts together. The order also cut in half, uh, cut, cut by more than half the number of refugees that would then be resettled in the United States uh, once the when resettlement began uh, during the year 2017. Now that President Trump issued this order seven days into his fledgling administration came as no surprise. On December 7, 2015, then-candidate Trump published a, quote, statement on preventing Muslim immigration on his campaign website, uh, proposing a, quote, total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what is going on. This statement remained on the, the, the campaign's website until May of this year when it suddenly disappeared after a Fourth Circuit judge asked about it during oral argument. Um, all hell broke loose upon the order, order's issuance. You all know this very well. The day after the order was issued, protests broke out at airports across the country as customs officials began to enforce the travel ban by turning people away from their flights and detaining those from the designated countries as they arrived. That night, Ann Donnelly, a judge in the Eastern District of New York, issued a t temporary restraining order prohibiting the government from enforcing the travel ban by removing foreign nationals who had already arrived or been in transit uh, before the order's issuance. So a, 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 a TRO that was limited to certain uh, targets of the executive order. Two days later, to add to the drama, Sally Yates, then acting attorney general, announced that she would instruct the Department of Justice not to defend the uh, travel ban. And that night, of course, she was fired uh, uh, for, uh, because to quote the White House, she betrayed the Department of Justice. Lawsuits then proliferated like wildfire. Um, as of August 10th, when I last looked, there were 24 active cases pending nationwide, with a couple dozen more closed. But the primary action moved from Brooklyn to Seattle, to a case brought by the state of Washington and the state of Minnesota. The states alleged that the travel ban injured their interests because it prevented students and faculty, uh, who were nationals of the affected countries, from studying and teaching at the universities. On February 3rd, about a week after the travel ban's issuance, James Robart of the Western District of Washington issued a temporary restraining order in force nationwide, barring the implementation of the uh, uh, executive order's provisions, banning the entry of nationals from the seven designated countries and the entry of refugees. 
Now, the president didn't like this. He took to the time-honored legal strategy of tweeting a measured, carefully vetted response. Uh, I've been working on my Trump impression. Worked really hard on this for hours this weekend, standing from here, but I can't bring myself to do it. There's the, here's the tweet. Just cannot believe a judge would put our country in such peril. If something happens, blame him and court system. People pouring in, bad. The government, that's not my impression, okay? It's better than that, but it's still not ready to be unveiled. The government immediately appealed to the Ninth Circuit, seeking a stay of Petero's entry. Now, it is important that this is the posture of the case, because a party seeking a uh, a TRO stay, the stay of the temporary restraining order bears a pretty hefty burden. It must make a strong showing that it will succeed on the merits, uh, uh, as well as a showing of irreparable injury absent the stay. Essentially, this, uh, this appellate posture flips the burden that parties ordinarily bear in a TRO proceeding. In, the, in a February 9th opinion, the Ninth Circuit held that the government had not met its heavy burden. The Ninth Circuit seems to have found particularly compelling the government's inability to show irreparable harm from the TRO's continuation. Uh, the court observed that, um, uh, that no national from any of the list of countries had perpetrated a terrorist attack in the United States, and the government had provided no identification of laws and existing screening procedures that would give reason to fear an attack during the, excuse me, during the litigation's pendency. Also, the Ninth Circuit noted that many of the people affected by the travel ban, including, for instance, uh, legal permanent residents trying to re-enter after traveling abroad have solid claims that the ban's enforcement against them violate their due process rights. Rather than seek review, the president announced shortly after the Ninth Circuit's decision that he would reissue the executive order. Discussing the litigation, the president insisted, I keep my campaign promises. A few days later, aides to the president insisted that the new order would reflect minor technical differences and produce the same basically po basic policy outcomes for the country. On March 2nd, 2017, the president issued a new, or second executive order. This one made several changes. Iraq came off the list, and Syria was no longer singled out for special treatment. The travel ban no longer applies to those who had valid visas as of January 27th, such as legal permanent residents. And the, the travel ban exempted refugees who had already been screened to enter from the suspension of the resettlement program. Finally, and importantly, the second executive order uh, made a change as far as refugee, refugee prioritization. The first executive order stated that upon resumption of refugee resettlement, the United States would prioritize refugee claims from those uh, who are religious minorities in their home countries. Effectively, this prioritized Christian uh, refugees from Muslim countries, a provision that fueled claims that the travel ban was really a Muslim ban. The second order dispensed this preference. Now, those pesky civil rights organizations and Kinko Kami State Attorneys General weren't satisfied. They continued the litigation. The action shifted from Seattle to Honolulu and Baltimore, or wherever the election was in Maryland. The state of Hawaii challenged the second travel ban, alleging a harm similar to Minnesota's and Washington's. Uh, and in Maryland, several people uh, whose family members could no longer enter the United States joined with a couple of refugee support organizations to challenge the ban. District judges in both states entered preliminary injunctive relief, banning the executive order's implementation, and the Ninth and Fourth Circuits largely upheld the orders. Now, the two circuit decisions are quite different. The Ninth Circuit's uh, opinion includes a careful parsing of relevant statutory provisions, resulting in a dry, somewhat technical opinion with no explicit comment on the extraordinary constitutional moment that the travel ban uh, has spawned. The Fourth Circuit saw no such need for restraint at least the majority opinion. And here's how it begins, here's how it describes the executive order in its very first paragraph. The, exec the, travel, the executive order is a document that, quote, in text speaks with vague words of national security, but in context drips with religious intolerance, animus, and discrimination. Later, the opinion laments that, quote, from the highest elected office in the nation has come an executive order steeped in animus. So this, the Fourth Circuit spares, spares no words. The Supreme Court granted cert and in June in an extremely careful opinion that sheds little light on what most justices plan to do in this case, uh, the court partially stayed the injunction's enforcement. Um, the, uh, the government cannot enforce the uh, uh, travel ban against those with a close relationship with a person or entity in the United States. So uh, parents, uh, 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 parent, uh, I think, well, parents and children, I'm gonna leave it at that, uh, are clearly um, uh, can clearly benefit from the preliminary injunctive relief and continue entering. Um, uh, the order can also not be enforced against people of a formal, documented relationship with an American entity, such as a student already admitted to the University of Hawaii. Otherwise, the government can go ahead and 
um, enforce the travel ban during the pendency of the court's review, which is scheduled for, I believe, October 10th and 11th. Um, one of those days, maybe both. There's been a lot of litigation since the court's uh, intervention in June over exactly who can continue to benefit from a preliminary injunction who has a sufficiently close relationship. Most recently, the Supreme Court upheld <coughs> Judge Derek Watson's order, Judge Watson's a Hawaii judge, insisting <coughs> on an expanded definition of close family relationship to include <coughs> parents. Um, but the court reversed Judge Watson's insistence that the injunction applies to benefit those with a, who already have a relationship with a refugee resettlement agency. Um, okay, so that's the litigation posture. Let me identify the two major <coughs> claims at issue in this litigation. The first main substantive claim does the travel ban violate the establishment clause of the First Amendment? Now, let me introduce this claim with the gist of the Fourth Circuit's decision, concluding that the order was in fact unconstitutional. The constitutional argument, as I understand it, has two layers. First, under a case called Mandel, the executive's decision to exclude a foreign national on the basis of a facially legitimate and bona fide reason can't be reviewed. To get to the establishment clause, then, the plaintiffs had to show that President Trump did not have a facially legitimate and bona fide reason to issue the executive order. This steered the Fourth Circuit toward indicia of President Trump's intentions. This, after, I imagine just, Judge Snow might have some comment on this. Um, here, uh, the court, Fourth Circuit drew extensively on candidate Trump's rhetoric about Muslims and immigrants. Now, this is a quite remarkable refusal to have the court's gaze cabin to the four corners of the executive order and its stated rationales, and instead focus on um, extrinsic indications of what the president wanted to do. These indicia, the Fourth Circuit declared, indicated a lack of good faith and thus allowed the court to subject the, to the order to more searching review. These indicia all but ensured that the Fourth Circuit would likewise find an Establishment Clause violation the second layer of the analysis. The government violates the Establishment Clause if, it takes an, if its action lacks a secular legislative purpose that is genuine and not a sham. The Fourth Circuit again marshaled an extensive array of campaign statements, including one remarkably unhelpful one by Rudy Giuliani that all but confirmed the travel ban's religious motivation to reject the government's argument that national security, not religious animus, motivated. Rudy Giuliani went on television shortly after the executive order's uh, issuance and basically said, the president came to me and said, let's do something really illegal, but figure out a way to, so it doesn't seem illegal, and then we'll do it. So this was, this was Giuliani's att attempt to defend the executive order. It didn't help very much. Okay. <laughs> This is the Establishment Clause claim. The Ninth Circuit didn't go down the constitutional road, at least explicitly, and instead held that the travel ban failed a statutory test. President Trump purported to act pursuant to uh, 5 U.S.C. Section 1182F. And this, this statute reads as follows. Whenever the president finds that the entry of any aliens or of any class of aliens into the United States would be detrimental to the interests of the United States, he may suspend the entry of all aliens or any class of aliens as immigrants or non-immigrants. Now this statute seems quite broad. It seems to give the president a huge amount of leeway. But the Ninth Circuit held that the president did not, quote, find that the entry of people from the six countries or the suspension of refugees would be detrimental to the, the United States. A lot of the supposed findings in the executive order, the Ninth Circuit reasoned, weren't really findings at all, and certainly not ones that the entry of these people would hurt the United States. For instance, a lot of the reasoning in the executive order has to do with reducing burdens on agencies for a short period to allow them to undertake the review of existing procedures. These supposed findings, the Ninth Circuit insists, have nothing to do with current vetting standards and why they are not sufficient to safeguard the interests of the United States. Another example of the court's reasoning, the executive order says that the number of refugees will be cut from 110,000 a year to 50,000 per year. And the court says, well, there's nothing to indicate why the um, the 50,000 in first refugee or the 75,000 refugee would be harmful to the national interest. There are no findings here. Okay, so that's, that's an overview of the substantive claims at issue. There's a ton more going on, uh, uh, to, a ton more to say about this travel ban litigation. I've tried to set up the procedural posture and the legal theories that are implicated, but I think it's uh, important for the uh, panel now to set us all straight on everything else complicated that's going on. So, uh, Professor Dorfler, um, is the Supreme Court even going to intervene on this? Right, well, so, so I think the, 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 the threshold question is, is the court going to have to deal with this? Because I think it's quite reasonable to believe that they just would rather not. I think this is a, well, it's a variation of adult saying that. I'm going to just feel mind speaking. Yeah, right. sorry. So there's a variation of adult saying is that it's, 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 it's bad cases make bad law. Uh, and this strikes me as a possible example of that. So, so uh, Professor 
markets talked about sort of searching inquiry that the Ninth Circuit did, and sort of and basically evaluating the president's assessment of the security risk posed by various aliens. Um, I think it's fair to say that that's a that's a sort of uh, that's a more aggressive review of presidential national security findings than we're used to having. Uh, the question is, is this case going to lead to a Supreme Court decision that sanctions and makes that the new status quo? Uh, now, one way a court might avoid having to, to write that opinion would be to say that, the, that this whole uh, dispute is uh, what's called uh, in legal terminology moot, which is basically to say that the dispute no longer exists. There's nothing at stake at this point. And so what's the argument for that position? It's that, well, the presidential order uh, says uh, from 90 days, for, for a period of 90 days from the date upon which this order is effective, uh, Department of Homeland Security shall do such and such. And the argument is to say, well, 90 days have elapsed since the effective date. The effective date was March, I think March 16th, something like that. So the, the order ran out uh, on June 16th, right? So there's no dispute anymore. So that's the, that's the an argument for mootness that a number of people have advanced. Um, I think at this point, it would be hard for me to see the court accepting that argument. Uh, the government's put forward the position that Basically, as soon as uh, the initial injunction was imposed, uh, that basically told the effective date. So the effective date has yet to, the order has yet to become effective. Only once the, all the, the injunction in its entirety is lifted will the order go into effect. And so only, only at that point will the 90-day clock start to, start to tick. Um, now, Professor Mannheim knows, probably knows more about this than me, but generally speaking, courts tend to defer to the executive branch in its interpretation of its own legal documents. Uh, and so I would imagine that the court would be relatively disposed to defer to the executive's interpretation of its own order, which I think is at least fairly plausible, if not the most natural reading. Uh, so then the question is, well, what, so, what's, so what kind of opinion is the court then going to write? Uh, it's interesting. I don't know. Professor Marcus said that he thought that the, that the Supreme Court's earlier order on this was not a good preview. Uh, I wonder if that's true, right? I mean, it was it was a bit of what what, what the judge called it, you know, something for everything order, right? Where we're going to trim back here, but we're going to let that go forward. Uh, it seemed had sort of a more of a sort of political character, right? Sort of trying to cobble together as large a majority as we could without maybe the clearest rationale for why the court was drawing the lines that it did. Um, I don't know, if I, was a, if I was a betting person, which I'm not, I would probably wager that, that if the court has to write an opinion on this, it'll read something like that. In an effort, to, I think, to avoid articulating clear lines that either authorize conduct that we think is problematic on the one hand, or on the other hand, sort of forces courts to engage, get its sort of hands dirty with national security questions as a rule. That's just my, my prediction. Um, let me ask the judge, uh, how extraordinary, you brought up, you brought up the, the disinclination that you have and your, your, your sense that courts aren't really good at digging into intent. The Fourth Circuit's opinion is remarkable because it draws upon all of these, these statements that the president and, and, his, and, and his representatives of his campaign, both before election and after inauguration, that they made about this policy. Um, uh, and it doesn't, doesn't limit itself to the executive order itself. Uh, what are your thoughts about that, about the Fourth Circuit's, uh, the, the, how extraordinary is what the Fourth Circuit did here? Well, I will, make a, I will make a prediction, too. And that is, regardless of what the Supreme Court does, it's not going to affirm the Fourth Circuit on, on what it found. Um, what the Fourth Circuit has done, I mean, it is, it's a fascinating case because what the president, has, it involves the personality of the president and what he's said through tweets or otherwise, I think is fair game for a court to consider in appropriate circumstances for what the intent is. But I, I also think it's difficult for this president to believe that he speaks with enough precision that he says what he really means. Do we really believe, do we really believe that President Trump hates Muslims and wants to exclude Muslims? Or do we believe that he wants to exclude that, that group of radical extremists that are the population that can be found in these countries that he views as a threat to the United States? The problem, part of the problem with the Fourth Circuit opinion is they do cite some fairly outrageous examples uh, that are 
but that are fair game, but also it does substitute a lot of its own judgment about security decisions that I just think no, I just think the Supreme Court is not going to presume that the courts are appropriate entities to be engaging in that kind of security analysis. I mean, the other thing I would say is I think it's, we've talked about the free exercise clause, and that's really the basis on which the Fourth Circuit made its de determination, but I mean, it's kind of an interesting case. Let's assume, let's assume there is a radical Islamic sect called Haifu Square. And their avowed purpose is to destroy all secular governments until God comes to reign. If President Trump issued a travel ban in that instance saying Haiku Square is banned from the United States of America, are you going to find that unconstitutional because it's a violation of the Free Exercise Clause or, an, I guess it's an establishment, an establishment of religion to exclude Haiku Square? And I don't think you're going to be doing that. So I think there's a lot of things that the Fourth Circuit engages in here that would really usually be well beyond the pale. But because of the unusual circumstances in which they were raised, they're only kind of beyond the pale. And I think there's so other, so many other ways that the court can resolve this, they're going to opt for one of those other ways. Do you have any thoughts as to why? I mean, I, the Fourth Circuit opinion really is extraordinary. Um, do you have any thoughts as to why? The judges would have, and there, there are concurring opinions by judges who don't go down, don't agree with the majority that this is, you know, it should all decide on the established clause. Let's look at extrinsic evidence of his intent and so on. So on. Why do you think the judges were drawn, the judges who joined that opinion were drawn to do so? Any thoughts on? I will tell you my speculation, and I don't think it's an appropriate role for a judge, my speculation, so I may be wrong. But I think in the initial stages of the Trump administration, these judges were so afraid that he seemed to be unrestrained in what he was willing to do that they want, I don't really think anybody on the Fourth Circuit expects they'll be affirmed, but I think they wanted to send the president a message, which is, what you say makes a difference. And I think they may have sent that message. That's a door for you. Yeah, just on this, because in, in, in some of my written work, I've actually advocated that courts should, at least in certain conditions, pay more attention to uh, public statements of public officials. Uh, on the on the rationale that well look legal documents at least most of them are supposed to be intelligible to the public right to the citizens uh, and so of course it's natural that citizens sitting at home watching the news would when so trying to make sense of a legal document call to mind well all of the statements I've heard various officials make about this document right so if we're trying to get a sense of well what, what is this travel ban about and then you know if you're reading this and you follow President Trump on Twitter as many people do or read about his tweets on CNN or watch about his tweets on CNN right it's natural that you're going to call that information to mind when trying to make sense of his policies now having at the same time having seen an opinion like the Fourth Circuit um, in, in another work <laughs> I have suggested that look if there's there if, if certain types of information are such that even though they seem relevant uh, or they are relevant they're also we're sort of prone to fixate on them and maybe sort of obsess over that type of information over other sources uh, looking at the fourth circuit opinion and others I, it maybe start makes me start to think maybe public statements by officials fall into this category where in a way you know given those incendiary tweets uh, the, the, the Fourth Circuit is able to cite, in a way, one starts to get the sense of, well, there's nothing that this administration can do to cancel the, the appearance of discriminatory motivation based on those tweets. Uh, and so this might give sort of reports reason to sort of actually abstain from considering information like this, just because it's sort of too gripping, it's too visceral in a way that other sort of legal information maybe isn't. Well, the other thing I'd say in the area there was a very famous concurrence from a long time ago about presidential power, so we'll rope in our other two panelists on this one. And it was written by Justice Jackson in the steel seizure cases, and he talks about the legitimate realm of presidential action in areas that aren't quite clear and areas that are. And he, he says in that concurrence, which has been very influential in terms of analysis of presidential action, that when a president acts in an area that is that he acts both with congressional authorization and in areas of traditional presidential exercise, he is acting in his greatest power base. And arguably, that's what President Trump is doing here. And so when he makes these outrageous statements 
that suggests that he's not acting constitutionally. But you have to balance that with a whole huge delegation of presidential power that suggests that under the circumstances, you ought to be very, very careful about invalidating that. So to, I'd like to hear from the Dean of Professor Mannheim um, about the, I, I think this case is a sentence all scurrying to the INA, the Immigration Nationality Act, and trying to parse the very complex statute, but there's also the constitutional claim underneath it. What's your sense of the strength of these claims, statutory and constitutional? Um, so I think this case is extraordinarily difficult. Um, I think that if the court, if the Supreme Court can find a way of um, dealing with it in a way that does not require them to go down the Ninth Circuit through or the Fourth Circuit through, I think that the Supreme Court will do that. Um, I think it's also clear that the Supreme Court doesn't want to simply dismiss all the claims. Um, uh, they may end up doing that. They may end up just saying that the, that the Trump administration wins on everything. Um, but given what they did uh, with this uh, preliminary ruling, um, it's clear that that's not, that's, that's not, it's not, it's not obvious to them that, that that should be the right answer because they did um, allow some preliminary relief to go forward. Uh, I, I think that um, each different road you go down has its own problems. Um, the Ninth Circuit, I, I agree with uh, uh, Professor Dorfler that um, interpreting the INA in the way the Ninth Circuit interpreted it uh, is so uh, dissimilar to the way that the Supreme Court normally would interpret a statute like that, um, that it calls into question why would the court take an approach that ignores the extraordinary circumstances here that are requiring uh, a heightened review. Or stated otherwise, what the Ninth Circuit tried to do was say, look, this case is not unusual. We're just engaging in normal statutory analysis. Um, so isn't that great? We're not trying to say that there's something different here. The problem with taking that approach is that then, going forward, presumably in every non-extraordinary circumstance, we're supposed to interpret statutes that same way, and that's very problematic. Um, by contrast, uh, I agree with uh, Judge Snow that the Fourth Circuit's decision is also very um, uh, sort of difficult to swallow, and that's because the Fourth Circuit is um, really just diving in. I said it before that the court needs to get messy sometimes, and, and I agree, I mean, I, I continue to have that position, but the Fourth Circuit is getting really messy in that opinion. Um, it's just diving into stuff that the courts have a really hard time grappling with, which is essentially uh, the motivation behind facially neutral statutes, uh, or here, uh, executive orders. Um, the third approach would be uh, the one that um, professor talked about a little bit, which is find a way, sort of, uh, sort of non-lawyers would call it a technicality, so find a way of getting rid of this case on a technicality. Um, and I would not be surprised if the court tries to do that, but uh, for whatever reason, the Trump administration has made that difficult by uh, providing guidance that suggests that maybe this case still is ongoing, even though it's been more than 90 days. Um, to that end, though, I would go back to the uh, opinion that was the, the Supreme Court's sort of interim opinion, where at some point, um, <laughs> The, uh, the court writing, it's called per curiam, that means they don't say which justice wrote it, they sort of all come together and, and proceed as though the opinion was written by all of them. Uh, the court says, given the government's representations in this litigation, we fully expect that the, the relief we grant today, and this was back in June, uh, we fully expect that the relief we grant, grant today will permit the executive to conclude its internal work and provide adequate notice to foreign governments within the 90-day life of Section 2. And um, translated, what that means is uh, the Supreme Court is saying, hey, administration, you said you, have, you needed 90 days. You're getting 90 days, so do something with it. And I would not be surprised if the Supreme Court tries its hardest to come back to this and to basically say, look, whatever you needed, you had that time. So let's make this case go away. So what a jam. You know, the, the basic constitutional question gives um, the because of the steel seizure case in, in general, the federal government in the first place tremendous authority over immigration. Um, uh, it's also a nod toward national security. And if anything having to do with immigration, there's potentially also interstate commerce clause, and it's a big, big, big buckets of power. Then the next question is, well, does the president have authority to execute um, on these huge buckets of power? And, and it's now, some, how big the buckets are itself could be subject to debate, but the court has called it plenary power. Ooh, no, wow, okay, superpower. 
Um, and, and they have expressly delegated to the President of the United States vast authority to execute these powers. So they start with the presumption of a heavy, heavy hand on the side of, well, of course, of course he can do that, right? Right. Except that, um, and, and everybody, including, I mean, I'm particularly interested in what people who believe in the most robust conception of, of, of presidential power have had to say about this. They're called Unitarians, the Unitary Executive. And they're completely freaked out by the implications of a rubber stamping or approving of a lot of what President Trump has done. And so even if you are a, 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 a you know, very devoted pro-federal power and expansive interpretation of presidential power, uh, Unitarian, um, but you think that all works if there's somebody we can reasonably trust to have some judgment, and you've lost that confidence, um, then you're in a jam, and I suspect that that does describe a few members of the court. So what are you gonna do? As a practical matter, um, you know, I think on the mootness point, um, that's a way. You can run, but you can't hide. I mean, it's a way of, of putting it up for a little bit. But I think that, that if you were sitting there, wouldn't you look for a way uh, uh, to moot this and try to avoid vacating the underlying judgment here in order to demonstrate that the institutional barriers to lawlessness still exist? Uh, I think of Jack Goldsmith, who was in the Office of Legal Counsel, now a professor, and he's written brilliant stuff on this, and he said, we have to, is there, is there any reason to hope that the institutions still work? Uh, and given what we've seen since the, um, uh, the inauguration. And one thing he points to that should give you hope is the courts, and that they have put speed bumps in, this, in, in, in the way uh, of the court. The Fourth Circuit did this, I think, very effectively. Um, so four mootness would be avoiding having to write an opinion for the ages that takes away executive power that we might need tomorrow should we have somebody who's more responsible exercising that power than some people think we currently have. Um, uh, against mootness is, you know, it will still come up again, it's a dodge, it's capable of repetition, and yet evading review by some people's accounts. Uh, the court's got institutional risk no matter which way it goes. It'll look like it's punting. It's already kind of weighed in on the merits um, a little bit. They've decided some goes, some doesn't. Um, Trump already has three votes in his pocket. They've made that clear. So let's go to the merits. Okay, then you get to the merits, and you have first what I'm talking about, which is this huge argument for executive power that should make you as a judge very apprehensive about saying you can't do it. But you also have the, the case law um, that suggests that the executive's not above the law. And, uh, and, and a very baseline to me due process principle, you know, that you know, uh, just a, a basic amount of, of uh, homework needs to be done in order to call it a law, to call it a legitimate law. And aspects of the executive order were ridiculously baseless uh, in terms of the argument in favor of national security. And so, you know, we shouldn't just blink in the face of that and the court um, I think we'll worry about saying something that makes it look like they're potted plants with respect to that. Now, the Establishment Clause, it is difficult for them to look into a rummage around in intent. That's for sure. But let me suggest some reasons why um, this is a stronger case than some others. Um, first of all, everything he said. Second, unlike the take the blame amendment cases, there's one decision maker. This isn't like trying to figure out what a legislature meant. This is asking what the President of the United States intended. And it's contemporaneous statements that he and he alone made. And they're, 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 they're astonishing. I mean, we've become normalized to some extent. But when you go back and look at these things that he has, has actually said, um, uh, plus, it's not just religion, all religions, that what, like we were talking about with respect to the blame amendments. This is sectarian. This is specific to particular religious groups. And, um, and so it strikes me that there's a lot of reason why the Fourth Circuit did what it did, even if it expects to get reversed. Also, there's a wonderful article by April Shaw uh, that I saw recently, in which she takes seriously the question of, it can't be right that everything you say on a campaign trail can be used against you later. But unlike you know, musing about it, you know, from shooting from our hip, she actually, in her article, goes through all of these different scenarios and tries to come up with a taxonomy of when we might 
legitimately look at these extraneous statements as some evidence of intent and concludes that the executor order qualifies. Uh, if they were asking about these extraneous statements in order to prove the scope of the order, she says no. But if we're looking at the purpose of the order, um, uh, she says she thinks it's, it's problematic but within the realm of what should, can be legitimately considered by courts. And last, you know, it's so ironic. Um, you know, we're, we, we're willing to look back to 1779 um, and other part of the other aspect of the 18th century and try to figure out what the public meaning was and the original intent of words. Um, and we think we can do that in defining. Well, um, you think we can. You think we can. No cookie for you tonight. <laughs> but we don't think we can figure out what President Donald Trump meant with respect to this order. Um, uh, strikes me as is a, is a little bit cockeying. I have many, many other questions and, and things to say in response, but we, we have about eight minutes, and this is a big, big issue, so I definitely want to ask for, for your comments and questions. Um, yes? I want to throw something in the cloud because you're talking about intent, but what I'm looking at is habit. If you're looking at evidence, he has habit, and his habit is just to random, in my perspective, randomly throw out things, and then the next day reverse them. And he's so consistent in that habit that I suspect that the Fourth Circuit might have also been, in a sense, looking at that. Or is that just the wrong kind well, of... Well, wait a second, right? I feel like exactly. this is the of the judge earlier. If, if this is the kind of guy who just kind of says stuff, well, then we shouldn't take an individual statement too seriously. Well, yeah, but, you know, that's not the point. The point is the man is the president. So... When you're looking within the law, you're looking not at his character, you're looking at his habit. Oh, good. <laughs> the only thing I would say is, as a trial court judge, I mean, this, this case has never gone to trial. And I'll give you an interesting fact that you may not know. I was here with Judge Robart in January. He was here in Tucson when he was deciding this case because he was here on the Ninth Circuit Education Days. I'm on the Education Committee. He came down and, and I was talking to him and he was in the middle of messing with this case. Well, I was here in Tucson. But if you're a trial court judge and this actually went to trial, there are all kinds of rules of evidence about what kinds of things can come in and what kinds of things can't come in. I'm not sure that you could introduce evidence. I mean, maybe you could, but it would be pretty tough to say, this guy is just an irresponsible person. His habits are bizarre, and if you did, part of the reason why that would be difficult is, as Professor Dorfler suggests, where does that really get you? What? Well, I, I, I guess so I'm you have to look at the statements. Okay. And, and Judge or uh, Dean Massaro suggests, in opposition, I think to my point, but her point is fair, and I think it is what the Fourth Circuit's trying to get to is, you said these things, yeah. and you. You've got to be held responsible for saying it. It's just that he's such a unique character. It's very dangerous for a court when they're when they're dealing with an area of responsibility that is so uniquely granted to a president to say, we're going to invalidate what you've done because of what you said when there is a legitimate reason you could have done what you did. But I'm gonna, if it's okay, I'm going to ask another question just so we get more. Okay. Just thank you. But, uh, Professor Cohen. Uh, so I share the as one of many of the panelists uh, that it's hard to imagine the Supreme Court uh, following the path charted by the Fourth Circuit in this case. Um, on the other hand, uh, constitutional law is shot through uh, with a doctrine that makes the constitutionality of government actions turn on uh, the intent or the purpose that motivated them. Um, most of the time that works in favor of the government because it's really hard to demonstrate a motivating this purpose. Um, uh, so what are we to make uh, of, uh, of that sort of disparity? I mean, is, uh, are, do these doctrines uh, only come into play uh, when they help the government, um, uh, but never uh, uh, as a basis for uh, finding that governmental action is actually constitutionally valid? Or is there some other way to understand uh, this simultaneous 
emphasis on purpose and constitutional law uh, with this pervasive sense among a lot of lawyers and judges that uh, we can't ever imagine the Supreme Court resting institution on this ground. Um, so I, I think that's so I'll say this and I'll answer your question more directly. Um, one thing that's being presented in this case is that we have, in a sense, a new type of legal document here. Um, we have lots of doctrine and lots of case, case law and history relating to how to interpret and understand statutes, including how to look behind what they're saying on the face and, and look at purpose and intent. Um, we have uh, you know, a lot of understanding of how to um, uh, look at court opinions. We have um, a, a lot of uh, case law and rules relating to how to review actions within the executive branch not done by the president. Um, so for example, uh, for those who were following, um, have been following DACA, right, what's going on with DACA, um, a lot of people think of DACA as, uh, and that's the, that's the uh, order that came out during the Obama administration that protected certain uh, people who arrived in the country illegally as children. Um, a lot of people think of that as an executive order issued by Obama, but actually that wasn't an executive order. That was a memo uh, issued right. by Homeland Security while Obama was president. Um, and the relevance of what I'm saying is that once it's something issued by somebody else in the executive branch, we have ways, rules, precedents for how to understand it, how to deal with it. Um, we really don't have much of all, at all of precedent uh, relating to how to understand and deal with executive orders or other things done directly by the president. We do have a bit, for example, the very famous uh, steel seizure case that uh, the judge mentioned. Um, to my knowledge, I don't think we have any examples of uh, courts looking behind what's facially on an executive order and trying to look to intent. So this is uncharted territory when it comes to um, uh, how to deal with this argument that there's something beneath the face of this, this order that is unacceptable. Um, and so, <coughs> frankly, if this arose in a different context, that would have been really helpful for the courts, because then we wouldn't be in the situation where we're having something, something between a constitutional moment and a constitutional crisis, where the court is having to figure out all these different, really difficult issues, including how to deal with purpose in the context of these executive orders. Um, so uh, in answer to your question, uh, is, uh, you know, is, is, does purpose and intent only help the government? I would say no. There's plenty of precedent where it goes against the government. Um, one of the problems in this context, though, is we don't really have a situation where you have one guy who's saying a lot of stuff that looks really bad, and he's the one who personally drafts and signs the orders. And so the courts aren't really sure what to do with that. Doesn't that make it? Standards easier to apply in the context of big orders and other contexts? So I would say yes. Um, uh, but there's something unseemly about, so for example, as you said, you know, if it's one guy, let's start talking about habit. Let's put that in there, right? Whereas if it's a legislature, you're not going to have an argument like that. There's something about it having the one perfect person uh, that, that makes it more, I think, more unseemly for a court to deal with. But the flip side is I agree with you in terms of just evidence, in, in terms of the evidence, what does it mean? We got plenty of evidence about what that meant. There's a really interesting question along this, this just to follow up what Professor Mannheim said, um, whether to draw a line between pre-inauguration and post-inauguration statements. Um, would using these intrinsic indicators of intent chill campaign speech in a way? The Fourth Circuit said, great, because we don't want this kind of campaign speech. And Judge Kaczynski, in a dissent from the Ninth Circuit's decision not to take uh, a decision on Bonk uh, said, this is ridiculous. We, we, we don't want to chill campaign speech. You shouldn't, shouldn't hold. What people say in campaigns is very different from what they say when, they have a, they're, when they're in their official capacity. And I don't know. I don't know if that line uh, makes any sense that it's not the one. Um, no. You can't have it all ways. I think in the sanctuary uh, jurisdiction part of the order, um, uh, they, it, it had consequences right away. The judge enjoined that nationwide. And the Obama, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, Trump administration lawyers actually came to court and said, yeah, we see that language there, I'm paraphrasing, in the executive order in which they say these consequences are going to flow. But we didn't mean it. <laughs> it was, he was, was just, it was the bully pulpit. 
And the court, I think, absolutely correctly said, no, you're not going to get away with that. This is an executive order, and it may you know, be of, of somewhat uh, murkier status than a, than a, uh, uh, um, a statute, though not really. Um, it had consequences. And so as long as the executive order has consequences, the things he said about what it meant seems to me to be relevant uh, to those consequences. And the fact that there's just one author strikes me as improving the chances that the court uh, can. It's the other thing that's going on here that is, you know, which the judge is correctly pointing to, this, this distaste and apprehension. We, we can't second guess the President of the United States on this kind of an issue where Congress has given him this room. And so, and if you want to preserve that kind of authority for Lincoln, then you can't take it away from Trump, right? And you can't write an opinion that says, this ticket is good for this day only in this train, Bush versus Gore, right? You can't say, we're going to take the power away from you uh, because nobody trusts you with it. And if they can't write it that way, then I'd go for mootness. I'd go for something else that didn't force me to actually come down and look at that and admit um, to what the real anxiety it was. Maybe it's no longer there, but I think at the time the Fourth Circuit wrote the opinion, it was there and it was justified. Well, let me suggest my one concern about mootness. Uh, I think <coughs> Judge Mannheim made a good point, or Professor Mannheim made a good point. I think I, think, I really hope that it will be Judge Mannheim. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Professor Mannheim made a good point, but I think the Trump administration has tried to evade the mootness argument because they came down and said these orders become effective when they're lift when the stay is lifted. So if you take that on its face, it's not moot until the Supreme Court acts. Because there is still a stay in place. So the order doesn't even take effect unless and until the Supreme Court acts to lift the stay. I should also say that the, the respondents have conceded that the that the case is not moot. Just asserting that the order is still in effect. Uh, so in a way, here the Supreme Court would have to, to go over over both both parties to, to declare the, the, the case. Um, if I, this is this is sort of on point, but I but uh, I, I wanted to to take a second to, to say something about lower court judges. We talk a lot in in, in constitutional led discussions about the Supreme Court. Um, but one reason why we're up here some number of months before this all happened, talking about sort of these esoteric questions of mootness and how the court should approach it is because we are no longer where we were in uh, uh, early or I guess late January. Um, and just to uh, remind everybody, what initially happened with these orders was um, President Trump, without warning, uh, by all accounts, without consulting anybody, uh, issued an executive order that immediately stopped people from entering the country, even people who were in flight when it happened. Um, it applied on its face, it appeared, uh, and then there was conflicting guidance about the following. Uh, it seemed to apply to everybody who was a national in those countries, including people who are legal permanent residents, which is to say people who, while non-citizens, uh, are legally entitled to live in the United States indefinitely. Um, that, that's when we had the people at the airports, where we had the protests, where you had people not knowing what to do, you had people detained. Um, that situation could not stand. And all of the problems we're talking about right now were also present then. But what the lower courts did was, I thought, remarkable. The lower courts, which are filled with judges who disagree about a lot of different things, the lower federal courts essentially came together and they came up with a way of stopping that first order without answering any of these hard questions in a way that set problematic precedent. Um, and the result was that President Trump withdrew that order and replaced it with the one that's in, that's in uh, he wants to have in effect now, which while I find to be very problematic, <coughs> is it, several orders of magnitude better than that first executive order. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting when we talk about what the court should do here and the like, um, and I, I, I guess I just want to note for the record that uh, what the lower courts have already done with this executive order has been, I think, a huge success. I mean, the checks and the balances worked. And now we're having this discussion rather than having people write in airports. Well, I would, I, really, I would love to continue this discussion. We have a, a somewhat uninteresting uh, last session on whether the president can be indicted <laughs> to, get to, to, to get to. Uh, but I, but there, are, there are so many other issues to flag. And one of them that, I, that if we had time to, to, to following up on what Professor Mannheim just said, um, the remedial power of the federal courts, the power of a district judge 
issue a temporary restraining order enjoining nationwide uh, the implementation of an executive order of the president. That's quite remarkable when you think about it. There are all sorts of interesting legal questions of whether the whether the uh, a dis district judge has this remedial power under what circumstances. Attorney General Sessions got criticized, I think, rightly for the way he expressed the sentiment, but not necessarily incorrectly as a matter of law, for questioning whether a single federal judge uh, should exercise power in this, this manner. And that'd be really interesting to discuss. So if we have time uh, before we complete these exercises at 4.30, uh, to return to this, that's something I'd like, I would certainly love to discuss. But we don't have time for it now because we need to talk about obstruction of justice. Um, uh, this is our last session of the afternoon, uh, and this is one where there is no court case. Um, uh, there's simple, uh, si simply rank speculation. And so let's start to rankly speculate. Um, uh, we'll spend the, the rest of our, our time thinking through some of the key legal issues that might arise from Robert Mueller's investigation of President Trump for obstruction of justice. Now, it's possible that none of these issues that we'll discuss will ever reach any court. Uh, Robert Mueller might, dis might um, uh, decide that President Trump did not obstruct justice. For instance, he might decide not to uh, suggest proceedings against any of Trump's campaign officials or um, uh, any of the White House staff or, or officials who are under investigation. If so, there'd be nothing to litigate. If, however, President, uh, President uh, if, however, Special Counsel Mueller thinks that there's a there there, and if he signals that he intends to start some sort of legal proceeding against either President Trump or White House official uh, or campaign subordinate, a lot of very serious constitutional questions will inevitably arise. So we thought it might be helpful um, uh, to discuss some of these issues with the hope that today's analysis might uh, make us all informed observers about what might be coming down the road. As I see it, the special counsel's obstruction of justice investigation and all the public back and forth about it raise a number of really important <coughs> questions. Uh, these include whether the president can fire the special counsel, whether the president can be indicted while in office, whether the attorney general uh, uh, can control the special counsel, uh, can the president pardon himself? Can the president use pardons to, um, uh, to derail an investigation into subordinates? And the, and the list goes on and on. I, I couldn't possibly comment on all these issues. Just explaining what a special counsel is takes a huge amount of time. Uh, there's a lot of detail here. So this is what I'm going to focus on, what the special counsel is. Uh, there's a lot of detail here, so please bear with me. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful the panelists will, will have interesting things to say about everything else. Uh, before I turn to who the special counsel is and what his powers are, let me just give some legal and factual background. This is uh, probably uh, unknown to all of you, but it might be worth um, summarizing uh, chron chronologically. In July 2016, the FBI began an investigation into hacks of the Democratic National Committee's computer network. According to a report jointly issued by the FBI, the CIA, and the National Security Agency, Vladimir Putin ordered an influence campaign to meddle in the 2016 presidential election, the report concluded that it did so with the express purpose of undermining Hillary Clinton's candidacy. This campaign took a number of forms, uh, but among them was, were cyber attacks uh, conducted by the GRU, Russia's intelligence agency. On June 14, 2016, for example, the Washington Post reported that someone had hacked the DNC's computer networks. This story broke five days after a reported meeting uh, between Donald Trump Jr. and Jared Kushner on one hand, and various Kremlin-connected Russians. On the other, a meeting uh, described to Trump Jr. in an email as one for the purpose of providing damaging information about Hillary Clinton. On July 25, 2016, the FBI confirmed that it was investigating Russian meddling in the election. Now, fast forward to spring 2017. By this point, Michael Flynn, Trump's first national security advisor, had resigned under a cloud of suspicion fueled by undisclosed conversations he had with Russian government officials. To a lesser or greater degree, such clouds swirl among, uh, around other personnel affiliated with President Trump or his campaign, including, most importantly for our purposes, uh, uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Uh, in fact, on March 2nd, uh, Attorney General Sessions announced that he'd recuse himself from any involvement in the Russian investigation. This is a big deal because the Attorney General uh, supervises the head of the FBI. On March 20th, James Comey, then FBI director, confirmed at a House Intelligence Committee meeting that the FBI was investigating the existence of links between Russian officials and members of the Trump campaign and whether the two ever coordinated. He said much the same thing at a May 9th, I'm sorry, a May 3rd Senate Judiciary Committee hearing reporting that the FBI had opened investigations of several individuals associated with the Trump campaign. Six days later on May 9th, 
uh, President Trump fired Comey, purportedly acting on the recommendation of Rod Rosenstein, the Deputy Attorney General, who had taken over uh, supervision of the Russian investigation after uh, the Attorney General accused himself. Rosenstein um, uh, appointed Robert Mueller as special counsel on May 17th to look into possible collusion between the Russians and the Trump campaign. Uh, Mueller, the former director of the FBI, began an investigation into that, but as well, he looked into whether President Trump had engaged in the obstruction of justice when he fired uh, Director Comey, a fact that Trump confirmed in a tweet on, May, on June 16th, that he's under investigation for obstruction of justice. Now, this investigation is very unusual because a lot of the evidence of alleged obstruction of justice has surfaced publicly. Most of this comes from the now notorious Comey memos that, uh, that direct, the director wrote after a number of conversations with the president. Uh, as everyone knows, the president had several private conversations with Comey during which the topic of the Russia investigation came up. Most notorious among these was a one-on-one -on -one meeting in the Oval Office on February 14th during which Trump reportedly said of Michael Flynn, I hope you can see your way clear to letting this go, to letting Flynn go, he's a good guy, I hope you can let this go. Now there's other evidence in the memos uh, that Comey's firing was motivated by an effort to blunt or derail the Russian investigation. On May 11th, for instance, the president told an NBC reporter that he had, quote, that Russia thing in mind when he fired the FBI director. Not not a great thing to say in your own self-interest. All right, according to the U.S. Attorney's Manual, an obstruction of justice charge has three elements. Now, I should say this not knowing anything about obstruction of justice. And I've, sub I've come to learn, thanks to uh, uh, a couple of members of the panel, that the law on this is extremely complicated. It's uncertain which law would apply here or what, what have you. But let me suggest what I've, what I've seen in the, alert, in the, the reporting on this investigation, what law would, would might apply. Okay, obstruction of justice. There was a pending proceeding before a department or agency in the United States. The defendant knew of or had a reasonably founded belief that the proceeding was pending, and the defendant corruptly endeavored to influence, obstruct, or impede the due and proper administration of the law under which the proceeding was pending. Now, most of the action, as I see it, is a third prong. Does, did President Trump corruptly attempt to influence the Russia investigation? To prove this element, a prosecutor would have to show that President Trump engaged and activities, including the Comey finding, with a specific intent of meddling with an investigation. But this evidentiary problem is so far down the road of legal potholes that it isn't worth discussing, at least not for the next couple of minutes. Uh, and also, I have no idea what these answers are and that sort of thing. So I'm going to focus instead on a couple of really important constitutional questions uh, pertaining to the special counsel, who he is, and, who, and, and how he can be influenced. OK, so here's the big, uh, first big question. If the president believes that Mueller is honing in on an obstruction of justice charge, can he simply fire the special counsel? As a regulatory matter, the answer is no. The special counsel is a creature of regulation. Before 1999, a Nixon-era law called the Ethics and Government Act allowed for the appointment of a so-called independent counsel. The independent, independent counsel law was a robust effort to deal with a simple problem. The president controls the attorney general and thus the Department of Justice. The president can block any investigation adverse to his interests by telling the attorney general what to do and then firing the attorney general if he or she doesn't do it. But the president shouldn't be above the law, so what should we do? The independent counsel law allowed a three-judge panel to appoint an independent counsel at either the attorney general's or Congress's request. This lawyer would enjoy the full power of the Department of Justice, or the attorney general, I should say, for the specific matter under investigation with no oversight by the Attorney General. So this independent counsel was truly independent. But the problem was, in a number of people's view, that the independent counsel was too independent. This independence was too robust. Um, the independent counsel was too unaccountable. After uh, the Ken Starr and Monica Lewinsky episode of the 1990s, Congress let the independent counsel law lapse in 1999. But the problem remains. What happens if there's a matter that needs investigation, but the President doesn't want one? In 1999, the Attorney General adopted special counsel regulations to replace the independent counsel law. The special counsel isn't quite as independent. The counsel is special, but not independent. Okay, there's an important distinction. Very special person, just not independent. The special counsel is appointed by the Attorney General and supervised by the Attorney General. More on this later. But there are provisions to ensure the counsel's independence. Uh, even though it's just special and not independent, still there's some modicum of independence. 
Most importantly, the special counsel can be fired, and here I'm quoting from the regulations, uh, only for the, by the personal action of the Attorney General, and then only for misconduct, dereliction of duty, incapacity, conflict of interest, or for other good cause. These sorts of four cause removal protections are fairly common. Uh, the head of the Securities and Exchange Commission enjoys it, for instance, as do FTC commissioners. The idea is to create some independence from the president when, for instance, the head of a federal agency can only be removed for cause or for good cause and not at the president's pleasure, we call the agency an independent agency. Now, this regulation would seem to deny Trump the power to fire Mueller, but there are three issues. First, is this regulation constitutional? Uh, Dean Massaro mentioned something called the unitary executive theory. This is a view, an important view of executive power. And the basic idea is that all executive power is vested in the president, as Article 2, Section 1 provides. There's no seepage of this power into any other branch or anyone else. Only the president can wield executive power. And the corollary is that the president has plenary control over uh, uh, executive branch activities, executive um, uh, enforcement of the law, and so forth. A proponent of the unitary executive theory would brush aside the four cause removal protection in the regulations, as well as the language providing that only the attorney general can fire the special counsel. The president can fire anyone he wants for any reason. So that would be the, the constitutional argument. A second uh, question, can these regulations be altered? So if the president doesn't want to just fire Robert Mueller uh, and invoke the constitution, is there another route to the same end? Well, had the special counsel regulations been promulgated, pursuant to what we call notice and comment rulemaking procedures, then the answer would be no. The agency would have to go through the same cumbersome process to change the regulations. But they weren't. They were promulgated pursuant to a more obscure provision, one that allows the head of any department to promulgate regulations for the government of his or her department and does not require any kind of procedural uh, um, uh, hoops to jump through to do so. I don't see any reason why uh, Rosenstein couldn't change the regulations tomorrow. Couldn't just roll out of bed, you know, cut himself shaving, and then change the regulations. <laughs> if he did, his revised regulation could say something like, the president can fire the special counsel for anything, for any reason. Presto changeo, the regulation gets out of the way. A third question, could President Trump insist that Rosenstein fire Mueller upon pain of his own termination? The answer here is almost surely yes. The Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General serve at the pleasure of the President. Trump could order the Deputy Attorney General to fire Mueller, and if Rosenstein doesn't do so, Trump could simply say, you're fired, so there's my impression. <laughs> uh, he could do this again and again until the acting Attorney General does what Trump says. What's unclear about the situation is whether Mueller could challenge his removal in court. The special regulations are silent on this, suggesting that he couldn't. I actually think there'd be an argument that he could. Okay, next question. Short of firing Mueller, can Rosenstein, if either on his own or at Trump's behest, influence the course of the investigation? Here, the answer is a qualified yes. The regulations provide that the special counsel exercises the same power as a U.S. attorney. Now, the U.S. attorneys are supervised by the Attorney General. An Attorney General can order a U.S. attorney to cease an investigation or veto a U.S. attorney's call for an indictment. Uh, the regulations provide that if the Attorney General disagrees with something the special counsel is doing, the Attorney General can order it to stop. This provision would seem to render the special counsel regulations all but toothless as far as guaranteeing independence. But there's another provision. If the Attorney General orders the special counsel to stop an investigation or to stop an indictment, what have you, the Attorney General must report to Congress both what the special counsel was up to and why the Attorney General stopped it. So there's a political check on this. This regulation recognizes the reality that a special counsel is unlikely to indict a sitting president uh, and instead would hand off his findings to Congress. Impeachment, after all, is the explicit constitutional remedy for presidential misconduct. But the Attorney General might withhold any such report. The Attorney General could just change the regulations. The President could order the Attorney General to withhold the report, the regulations notwithstanding, citing his plenary power over executive branch activity under Article 2, Section 2. So there are a lot of what ifs, a lot of open constitutional questions, um, a lot of ways that this all could play out. Um, uh, I'm going to stop there uh, rather than drone on and on. There are a huge number of questions. Can the president even be indicted? Is that constitutional? I'd like to turn these over to the panelists. And I'll start with Professor Mannheim because she's writing a book 
called limiting presidential power. The limits of presidential, the limits of presidential power will be available hopefully in January. Um, yeah. So I will let her just respond to anything so she can put in a plug for her book. Very quickly, if you, uh, well, I'll leave it at that. Go ahead. Okay. Um, thanks. So I, I won't respond to any of the specific um, things that you mentioned, uh, uh, although each one could use its own hour of discussion. Um, but rather, I will respond um, by saying that the law is incredibly important, and it does an enormous amount of work in our country. Um, but at some point, the law ends its influence, and politics and other factors start to play a role. And when it comes to um, possible obstruction of justice uh, charges against the president, uh, which then in turn um, lead to the, the question of whether uh, the president may be impeached. Um, this is some. This is a place where the law only gets you so far, um, and so uh, I'll translate that in two ways. Um, first, one thing that people often want to know is, you know, could this, could this, or could that support impeachment? And um, you know, one way, one way of answering the question is, well, it depends. Are there, uh, you know, I'm not going to do the math and have in front of everybody, but. Um, are there uh, you know, 217, uh, 218, I guess, uh, members of the House of Representatives who think that they have enough political cover and have the political motivation to conclude that it does? If so, then there's going to be articles of impeachment that are that are passed. Um, is it going to be enough to then convict the, pre the president in the Senate such that he loses his job? Well, I don't know. Is it the case that there are 67 senators who, uh, you know, same question, think that this is something that they want to do? Um, if the answer to those questions is yes, it doesn't really matter what the lawyers think of uh, this, the criminal uh, statutes behind it. Um, and then uh, also, uh, very quickly, um, to the question, can the president fire the special counsel? Sure, I mean, the president can try, right? Um, and there's various ways that he could put pressure on people and move things around in an effort to, to get it done. This is something that President Nixon did, um, for those of you who either lived through or have read about the Saturday Night Massacre. Um, but I'll say that for what it's worth, I don't know how much it is worth, but um, the reaction of people in Congress to the idea that President Trump would overtly interfere with Mueller's investigation, their response is essentially, that's not okay. That's a red line. You can't do that. And if, again, if you count heads and there are 218 members of the House and 68, 67 members of the Senate who all agree with that, then he can try but there's going to be real consequences. But these are political consequences, not legal consequences. Yeah, just to just to echo that, I, I agree completely. Um, and and, and I, just, I just want to add that that that's by constitutional design, right? So our impeachment clause instructs uh, the Congress to impeach in cases of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Um, and if you ask, well, what's a high crime and misdemeanor? That's a great question. Uh, and, and 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 it's sort of up to Congress to figure that out. Right, and so really, so Congress really has a lot of latitude in terms of what it deems an impeachable offense, and so again, that's a sort of political question, just in version of the constitutional structure. Um, on some of the, just a few of the specific questions, uh, Professor Marcus raised. One is, I mean, again, to, just to, to be a statutory person, it's not at all clear to me that the current destruction of justice statute even applies to the president, given our current law of interpretation. Um, there's something called the canon of constitutional avoidance that instructs courts where if some legislative text plausibly admits of more than one reading, and one reading gives rise to serious constitutional questions, courts ought to prefer the other reading, the one that's constitutionally fine, clearly, even if that's the sort of less natural linguistic reading of, this, of, this, of the text. And so here, the obstruction of justice statute applies to quote unquote any person. Um, given that I think there are at least, given the, the, the unitary theory of the executive, I think there are at least serious constitutional questions as, whether, as to whether a president could be guilty of obstruction of, uh, obstruction of justice. Uh, my sense is that a court applying the candidate of constitutional voice would read the obstruction of justice not to, to be insufficiently clear so as to apply to the president. Now this is a question of whether Congress could enact such a statute, right? A statute that was crystal clear that surprised the president. I think it's a hard question, but that's not the, that's not the world we're in. Uh, uh, oh, oh. Well, let me, can I interrupt with, with yeah. just a follow-up on what both of you said, which has sort of brought us quickly to impeachment. And I, just to follow up on that, uh, is the fact that impeachment is provided for explicitly as a remedy for presidential misconduct, does that suggest that putting aside what the statute says, and I, you're, I'm sure you're right, Professor Gorfa, that the courts would want to see if they could read it to avoid the constitutional question, 
uh, but if they couldn't, and the president is subject to the statute. Um, uh, given the impeachments in the Constitution, is, in, is the indictment of a president on criminal charges unconstitutional? Can the president be indicted? I would think clearly no. Uh, that would strike me as an end run around the impeachment clause, right? So the impeachment clause is an, it expressly provides a mechanism for removing a sitting president. Uh, and if the president could be indicted on a criminal charge, uh, criminal charges falling well short of the high crimes or misdemeanors, for instance, uh, and then jailed, uh, at least assuming that jailing was an available remedy or available penalty, uh, it strikes me that that would be an end run around the impeachment clause, and so therefore has to be preempted. So that's what that's my opinion. Professor Manhart, do you have on this issue? Um, so I'll answer by saying that, um, you know, before I said that there's a place where law ends and then other things start to become important, um, related to that is that, um, so I was talking about politics, but there's also something that we refer to as norms. Um, and one thing that's been difficult uh, with President Trump coming into office is that President Trump tends to um, go right up to the edge of the, the law and, and, and by so doing disregards the norms, which in a sense are um, voluntary rules and expectations that other presidents and governmental actors have followed. Um, if we then take this, uh, think of this idea of norms and we apply it to the idea of uh, indicting a, pre a sitting president, uh, you'd have to either have Jeff Sessions do it, um, he's not going to do it, uh, or you'd have to have uh, Bob Mueller do it. And from everything I know about Bob Mueller, um, it does not seem to be the, to be the case that he would disregard um, very strong norm and understanding that you don't go up to the line like that uh, in something that is this high stakes and politicize the courts, uh, et cetera. And so I think one answer to your question is, you know, legally speaking, can the president be indicted? Well, I would say we don't know for sure because the court hasn't decided that. And I don't think we're going to know because I don't think that anybody's going to do it. One thing I'll add also, the impeachment clause provides that an, an impeached official shall be liable under the criminal law post <laughs> So it's not that the impeachment clause insulates, say, the president from criminal liability full stop. It's just that criminal, the like criminal indictment would have to take place after impeachment. Judge? Well, I actually think that the impeachment clause and, and the you know, clause that Professor Dorfler is talking about does not preclude the indictment of a sitting president. And in fact, uh, you and the materials listed a number of Office of Legal Counsel opinions suggesting both ways. Uh, I have a former partner who worked in the Office of Legal Counsel, and he said that there were two others that they referred to that also split. So in the Office of Legal Counsel itself, you have a number. In the Office of Legal Counsel, in the Attorney General's office, is the office that traditionally has advised the President on the legality of his actions. So you have a split even in the Office of Legal Counsel. But the truth is, you can't avoid uh, what Professor Mannheim has said. When we get into these areas, uh, what, what we're really talking about is what the people care about more than anything else. Uh, I can't help but be reliving Watergate when I was in eighth grade and I spent my summer watching the Senate Select Committee on Watergate with Howard Baker and Sam Urban and got some real ideas about government and what, uh, what could be done in a responsible system. But it's certainly my sense that today, people don't have nearly the taste or the outrage that existed in the Watergate times. I may be wrong about that. Uh, there is also, and you've mentioned it briefly, I think a telling opinion, uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist, who the center honors, uh, wrote the majority opinion uh, that, that would authorize the constitutionality of an independent council. But, uh, Justice Scalia wrote a dissent, which he said was his favorite opinion he ever wrote. And in that dissent, he basically said he thought it was the unitary executive theory that you can't have an attorney general authorized to do something that subverts the will of his president. So Scalia said, in the end, this is clearly this independent counsel statute that Chief Justice Rehnquist and the majority of the court found constitutional. He said it's clearly unconstitutional because of that reason, and in the end, and because the enforcement of laws is dedicated to the executive. Well, whether or not he's right about the unitary executive principle, he's right as a practical matter.
because in the end, he said, the only check that people have on a president who's gone lawless is the people themselves. To remove him through their executive, him or her through their executive, or to cease to elect him. And I think whether or not he's right as a constitutional matter, he's certainly right as a practical matter. Uh, the people will tolerate what they will tolerate, and certainly in a government that is Republican in the House, Republican in the Senate, and Republican in the White House. Unless the people have the same outrage that they had in Watergate, nothing is going to happen here. I would be interested, however, I will tell you, I don't think the courts are going to provide much of a remedy, because I think they're going to be very hesitant to find that a regulation that was not passed through the Administrative Procedures Act process is something that they can interpret as against the, to create a substantive right in an employee. Uh, but I'd be interested in your theory of the contrary. I agree. Um, you know, the, Mark Tushnet says that there's a difference between, and it was, this was all before the, the whole the Trump administration started to unfold, what he called con constitutional hardball. Um, and it's a case in which you insist that there actually be clear constitutional rules before you know, a court or anybody's going to hold someone accountable. And, the, and in the area of executive powers, it's one baffling enigma after another. It's under litigated. The court often says, well, it's a political question. Uh, even, you know, like the steel seizure cases, the, you know, great, we've got these three compartments to evaluate presidential power, and it's very difficult to determine what's in them. People say that it needs to be updated and revised. Um, I mean, there's, there's, the, to the extent that we have law, it's very difficult to figure out which way it goes. And then there's the there's the Charlie Black, who wrote, I think, still the best thing ever on impeachment. And I uh, said, you know, you just don't want to do that. You know, it's so horrible. Uh, it's so destructive. Um, so even if we got to that point, um, I think there's, there's practical reasons, even for those who might despise uh, the way things are going, uh, uh, to resorting to that nuclear option. Um, and you know, and then there's the Jerry Ford comment that what's a high crime and misdemeanor? It's, it's what what the the, the House decides it is. Um, so there isn't a lot of law here, in the strictest sense of the, the word, and and that pushes me back to what we're saying in connection. And I do disagree about the mootness point, but I'll let it go. I'll let it go. <laughs> <laughs> There was some inaccurate. Anyway, but I think that at the end of the day, if you, if you set up the law to give true power to someone, uh, assuming that they're going to be faithful to basic obligations, uh, then you can be a strong Unitarian like uh, 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 Scalia was. I don't know what he would say in this contest text. If we'd stick to that to say, so this wolf comes as a wolf, right? I think this president comes as a wolf in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, if the judges don't do anything about it and says to the people, well, then you need to do something about it, and that's the only revenue we have, so be it. Uh, but I think that's kind of weak. I think that's kind of weak when um, uh, fundamental questions of allocation of power in the legal system are at stake. So, um, but I do think that's what they'll do. You know? So I agree with all of the sad, sad, that's my tweet. Sad. <laughs> <laughs> sad. It's disappointing, but I think it's 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 accurate. Well, let me let me see if we can just just as putting the the I, I think that it, given who Robert Mueller is, it seems highly unlikely that what he's going to do is announce the indictment of the president. Um, if he indicts anyone uh, or tries to indict anyone, it'll be either cam former campaign officials or White House subordinates. That begs a really interesting question of whether the president could wield his pardon power uh, to effectively derail those uh, prosecutions from going forward. So I, I'd be interested in, I'm going to take Judge Snow out of this one, uh, he's had some experience with pardon <laughs> um, But uh, uh, I'd be interested in the panelists' thoughts about that. But before we do that, I wonder if I could return to Professor Brooker's comment parsing the impeachment clause. So, so I think if I understand what you, what you said, Professor Brooker, the impeachment clause says, there can be this impeachment, and that, it, and that afterwards, a person can be liable criminally. Well, it says shall be liable, and so one way of reading that is it's sort of after the fact. Yeah. So, 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 I, so I should admit that the language is not sort of tense on its face. 
right. but I think one would. But at the very least, it's what's clear is that criminal liability either comes into existence or persists. Oh, sorry, it's very clear that either criminal liability <laughs> comes into existence or persists right. criminal liability after impeachment. The impeachment is not, does not it's have not, any it's not, it's not, it's not an exclusive right. remedy. I guess my question about that explicit provision, and I, I, I think I agree with you as a matter of interpreting con the Constitution as being, uh, that the fact the Constitution contemplates a remedy for presidential misconduct is pretty dispositive of this question whether the president could be impeached. But that clause, that impeachment clause provides to a whole range of officials, and um, those officials we know can be prosecuted before they're impeached. And so I guess that, if that the fact that the impeachment clause doesn't differentiate between the president and everybody else, does that have any significance for its, its, its meaning? And the reason why I ask you is because you're a philosopher of language, and just last night you told me how language can mean different things depending on context. The same language can mean different things depending on context. Yeah, I don't know if I want to go that route here, though. Okay. I mean, so I can so give you that never argue with you for the ordinary reading, right, of the, of the impeachment clause. Because at least on its face, I don't see a basis for it. I agree, I don't see a basis for distinguishing the other, other officials yeah. subject to the impeachment clause. Uh, and so maybe my argument is just more, more revisionary than I Yeah. Uh, uh, well, because another strategy, as you suggest, would be to say that, well, no, the impeachment clause means something different when it's applied to the president than other officials. Now, you can see prudentially why you might be drawn towards that reading. Yeah. Um, I mean, the court has interpreted the president as having protections that are not textually included in the Constitution right. by virtue of his position as a president. So I don't think it would be uh, sort of without, totally without merit to make an argument like that. And I think that that's the heart of the Office of Legal Counsel's argument that the president can't be impeached. Yeah. Uh, just to give a little bit of it, it's a very interesting history, just what the various opinions um, the Office of Legal Counsel took the position in the 1970s, and then again in the late 90s that the president could not be indicted. Um, this, uh, uh, independent counsel, Ken Starr, solicited an independent opinion from a law professor that came to the opposite conclusion. And so there's this really interesting question of whether that Office of Legal Counsel opinion binds the special counsel, or whether the special counsel has sufficient independence to seek out uh, his own view of this matter. But, but let, me, let me go back to the pardons questions. Is this something that anybody has an opinion on? Uh, can the president wield the pardon power, or with this, or wielding the pardon power in this manner amount to obstruction of justice? Anybody want to take a stab at that? It's OK if not. I don't have any idea. Do you want to go for it? I'm tired of being the skunk at the party. You <laughs> I will be the skunk at the party. Okay. Um, so uh, I like being the skunk at the party. Okay. So um, uh, I guess I would say I'll give you sort of a legal answer, and then I'll try to give you a legal answer, and then I'll give you another one of my, you know, here's why I'm not going to give you an answer. Um, so uh, I think legally speaking, there is a good argument that the president can indeed obstructs justice through the pardon power. Basically, under the, um, uh, under the at least as a statutory matter, let's put it that way. I'll come back in a second. Uh, under the theory that um, if, some, if the president, for example, has the, the legal ability to do something, he can go ahead and do that. So he has the legal ability to pardon people. Um, just he had, like he has the legal, he had the legal ability to fire Comey, just like he has the legal ability to you know, stop an investigation, I mean, if, if he has good reasons to do so. Um, but if he does these things for the wrong reasons, then suddenly all those things become illegal. Um, so under that theory, you could say that, sure, he has the ability to pardon people, he just can't pardon people in a way that is in facilitation of a crime. Um, the counter argument would be something that's very complicated, uh, amounting to something along the lines of, Yes, but the pardon power is different because it's a it's something that's given to the president expressly in the Constitution, and um, there's almost like a separation of powers problem if Congress tries to criminalize that. Um, that argument may be correct. That second one, um, and this then gets me to the why I'm not going to try, try to even answer the question ultimately. Um, somebody, and I wish I remembered who it was, wrote something about um, why it's hard to answer these questions about obstruction of justice. And, uh, and, and my apologies to him for not remembering quite who it was. Um, but he said, look, you can answer these questions literally, you can answer them doctrinally, you can answer them uh, predictably, or you can answer them normatively. And by that he means you can say, like, literally, could President Trump pardon a bunch of people? And yeah, just do it. 
Now, is it constitutional? I don't know. He could just do it, right? But so the little question is easy to answer, but it's not interesting because nobody wants to know whether he could purport to pardon people. Uh, doctrinally speaking, can he do it? And that the question there is, uh, based on the case law and the decisions the Supreme Court and other courts have already reached, what is the answer? Does he have the legal power? And the answer to that is actually easy, but again, not very satisfying, because the answer is we don't know. There is a case law on it. Uh, predictably, and that one is to say, if he were to do it, what do we think the courts would do? And that's a little bit more interesting, but it's very hard to answer that question. It's really going to depend like, on a host of different factors, um, where you might have someone like Justice Kennedy, maybe in certain circumstances deciding one way, but then other circumstances deciding the other way. Uh, finally, there's the question of normatively, and basically what that is, is asking is, you know, let's look at the Constitution, look at case law, think about how we think about these things, and, and what do we think the answer should be? And that's actually quite interesting uh, to me, and to perhaps to others, but it doesn't really give uh, somebody the answer that he or she probably wants, which is the, which is the predictive answer. Okay, yes. yes I have a question, and I just wonder why um, because of the present administration's uh, continuous attacks on the courts, why wouldn't the judiciary uh, cease to continue to protect him under these circumstances? And I know, as most of you know, that the law depends on who's sitting there, who is the actual judge, who is the law clerk, what their political beliefs are. And there is law, in my opinion, to fit the need of whatever side you want to prevail. Am I wrong? Okay, so the question is, uh, this is something I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you asked. I've been thinking of a version of this question myself. Uh, in light of the, the, the president's statements about the judiciary that are, that are negative in character, why would the courts afford him protection? Uh, and, and especially since so much turns on uh, who the judge is and the personnel in that judge's chambers and the like. Do you have any thoughts, Judge Snow? I mean, if, when, when, when <laughs> if the president says things about your colleagues, do you take it personally? Do you, is that something that judges care about? Well, we're in a law school here. <laughs> you have to get three, you have to spend three years in a law school to get a degree, and the idea is that the law means something. And that judges take an oath and are bound to decide cases by the law. Does that mean that there is never a case in which a judge's own political leanings or personal impressions influence the result? Of course not. But I will say that in my experience as a judge, both in the state and in the federal court system, for about 15 years, the number of cases in which a judge's personal leanings make a difference is much, much, much smaller than people think it is. I have sat, in, uh, when I was on the Arizona Court of Appeals, I sat with colleagues who were very conservative and who were very liberal, and who decided cases that were completely inconsistent with their own uh, personal views or political views, which doesn't mean, again, that it never happens. But I will also say that I think judges who follow the idea that law actually is a discipline that should constrain decisions I think judges also would like to think that they have enough wisdom to, to uh, decide a case in a way that I think Dean Massaro presented very well, which is, if we're going to give the power to Abraham Lincoln to do some things, there is no way we can't give that same power to Donald Trump to do some things. And if we take away the power from Donald Trump to do some things, then we're taking away the power from the future Abraham Lincoln to do those same things. And so I would hope that part of the reasons why part of the reason why judges have a lifetime appointment, at least if they're federal judges, I would hope that judges have the discipline to have a long-term view and to have the faith to believe that any particular system or result that they personally object to is not permanent. But the law tends to be. Okay, other questions, and, and let me say, I think we can open this up to questions about any of the cases and any of the episodes. Um, uh, Jessica. Uh, yeah. um, kind of going off of her question, how do you think that um, public trust in the judicial branch plays into a lot of the decision making about these cases? Is, as you probably know, it's kind of the trust is decreasing. So 
So the question is, uh, how does the public's trust in the judiciary affect or enter into the decision-making calculus? And, and then the, the assertion, I'm, I'm not totally sure I agree, but the assertion is that the public's confidence in the judiciary is diminishing. Well, the last poll I read said so, but I could be Good, good. Well, I guess I'm going to win the answer. Right? <laughs> uh, are you going to answer? I just. I'd love rather have somebody else answer. <laughs> For what it's worth, I agree that the trust in the public is diminishing, and I think that's uh, a lot of the way. Uh, I'm going to try. I'm, I am going to avoid <coughs> commenting on anything involving cases that I've had. But the one thing that disturbs me most about a case that I've had recently that's been very high profile is a lot of the journalism tends to portray the, portray things as if it is judge versus litigant. Well, that is simply not the way it is. But I can't prevent the way that papers present things or that, pub, or that the public digest them. But I would also suggest that the same polls that you're reading uh, suggest that the public is losing faith in all institutions of government at a very high level. And I think it's always been a good idea for the public to be skeptical about their institutions. But when I was in law school, I had to drive somebody to an event like this. He was a pro professor from American University, so he was a, uh, he was a <coughs> Benedictine, who spent his life studying the law, and he asked me on the way from the airport to the uh, to the presentation, "Has the law made you more cynical about things?" And I said, "You bet it has." And he said, "Well, you need to remember one thing. And that is, you need to have the sense to be cynical about your own cynicism." And the fact that we are here, free, celebrating the Constitution. <clears throat> able to say all kinds of bad things about our president and everything else suggests that the system still does work and ultimately it still deserves some faith by the public and i don't know how to re-engender re that other than by being true to the trust that people have given me and everybody else to do the very best i can in an unbiased way do i fail sure and that's why the press should be able to comment freely on those failings or as they perceive them to be uh, but I think people need to learn to take a little bit of a dose of cynicism about their own cyn be cynical about their own cynicism. Because we do have a system that by and large works. That's what I'm saying. Well, I would say. I just take I'm gonna take the opportunity to respond. Um, one of the things that one of the I think a lot of what we talk about today, um, what's lurking in the background is the extraordinary pressure that the current uh, political moment has placed on the federal judiciary. Uh, uh, this goes back, it goes back several years. If you think about, um, if you think about uh, the President Obama's attempt to uh, um, adjust the way our immigration laws are enforced, uh, he did so in t uh, without Congress uh, uh, acting. And you can say what you want about about, uh, about President Obama's efforts at reforming our immigration laws, uh, but he did so in, uh, in, in the wake of decades of inaction by Congress. Uh, and, and then that, what that did is it just kicked it to the president and the courts to sort it out. Uh, that's a lot of pressure that's being placed on the judiciary to, to sort out some pretty big questions. And, and the pressure is there because Congress, some, I think many would argue, has abdicated its lawmaking responsibility. And if Congress were more agile or more active, uh, that that pressure wouldn't be placed on the court. So I think to a certain extent, um, uh, the weight that the court judiciary has to bear is, is not a, a problem of its own choosing. That's just my own personal view on that. Okay, other questions? Um, uh, yes. So um, we started with the case about um, funding a playground service with public money for religious or church. And I would like to see if you could explain to me why um, the Arizona Supreme Court found tax credits to religious schools and private schools legal um, when the Arizona Constitution says no tax shall be laid or appropriation of public money made 
in aid of any church or private or sectarian school or any public service corporation. It seems extremely clear. I've heard a lot of you know, the distinctions between free exercise and establishment. I have legal things. I'm a retired public school teacher and I'm very strong defendant of public schools. And I, for example, somebody used a really cool word during this discussion that was um, revocabularized. I don't remember who said that. But Ducey recently said public education is when we educate the public, which I'm assuming he means at religious schools and private schools. It's not what public education has ever been in the usual discussion. And it's very, um, you know, I, I had a long thing I wrote here. I won't go into it. But for example, in 2016, you could donate $3,256 if you were a married couple to a private school, which means religious school, but you could only donate $1,090, the same married couple, to a public school. And then, you know, I, I have a long thing here, but get into vouchers. So I don't understand how the Arizona Supreme Court has said that because parents choose to put their money they're funneling the money through parents to the, to the school of their choice. And the Arizona Constitution clearly doesn't uh, afford for that. So can, I'm still, even though I heard the, all the arguments about the playground for $20,000, this is millions and millions and millions of dollars. Okay. Now, how can parents be given the money? Right, right. The short version is one, in order to get in and object to some of these schemes, you have to have standing, and the court has narrowed the opportunity for people to go in and object. So some of it is just not even being able to get to the merits. But with respect to what you're saying is a clear, uh, the Constitution or the state prohibits, it doesn't. Um, it's been interpreted. Uh, uh, this is what the jujitsu, you know, intellectual jujitsu in the opinion, is that the state isn't making the decision to direct the funds to the religious institutions. They're willing to forego the revenue. You know, we can get this tax credit dollar for dollar if we give it to certain types of qualifying ends. Um, and, uh, and there are entities that then in turn uh, can make, uh, make these scholarships available to kids going to private school. And it's the parent's choice that they're selecting these to walk with their child this money to a religious destination. This is indirect and therefore not, not a violation of uh, the Establishment Clause. And what, what that is, what we were talking about earlier, is the ever-shrinking Establishment Clause. Um, but don't you think the Arizona Constitution is way clearer? This is the Arizona Constitution. It's way clearer than the uh, First Amendment. You know, I don't think anything's clear at all. Oh. Um, <laughs> so it's not, I, I think you know, the intention may have been clearer than the court imagined, but the, the, but the principle of parental independent autonomous decision making and the circuit breaker that they get to decide this is a worthy one that has its own constitutional you know, oomph to it. And uh, over a series of decisions, especially since 2002, the court has approved such mechanisms, notwithstanding the objection of public school teachers worried about depleting you know, public schools, or even older folk who worry about vouchers that were used as end runs around desegregation. Um, I mean, there's, there's a whole long history here. Lisa Goldwalk won't be one of the best, I think, in having read about it and tracked it. Um, but we lost, or your, your point of view lost. And the reason, the rationale they gave in good faith was it wasn't direct. I just wanted to follow up on something that Judge uh, Snow said earlier. Um, and uh, abstracting away from the current political situation, I wonder. Um, why courts shouldn't treat um, either an incompetent or mentally unstable president um, differently from competent and mentally stable. There, there, there actually was a recent board where it's like, oh, in the country law which is arguing that, that they actually, you know, that we should treat incompetent and mentally stable. Well, again, I think that's really not a, 
it's not a straight up question because if we have an incompetent president, one of the amendments to the Constitution provides for his removal. Are you suggesting that courts should make a decision that the president is incompetent and hence remove him? Or hence. Uh, yeah, so uh, really, it's, it's, it's that not that? a rhetorical question, uh, it's a serious question. Uh, and uh, and the, the question is not whether courts should undertake uh, to, to remove the president, but whether in reviewing the act of the president, they should be less deferential to a president uh, uh, in circumstances where the president is a true outlier, uh, either uh, on the dimension of competence or the dimension of mental stability or something else. Well, I, I may be wrong, and I'll certainly let everybody else talk, but I think what I said is uh, actually that they do. I think one of the reasons why there would be hesitancy about the Fourth Circuit opinion is because people don't believe that the president really has defined very well what he's talking about. <laughs> I think I said that, and that's, I think, the same point you made. Well, I think what he's reacting to, and when we talk about the law they make for President Trump is the law that would apply to President Lincoln. Oh, and we, and oh when I, I missed was, that. When sorry. I was saying it, I meant that, that I think that's the concern is that you know they create it and that it's very how is that opinion going to write um, uh, and i think the judges are reluctant to write an opinion in which they confess the full extent to which um, they think that it's aberrational and therefore they may look for ways or strategies around it if they explicitly took that on i think it, it I, I don't think a lot of judges would have a stomach for it but i think that as a practical matter it's happening it's already happened in that uh, judges have stood up uh, to these exercises of authority in ways that seem like a reach. And I think underlying it is some real anxiety. And the other thing I would say is, when you, I love the four parts. Uh, that, that's brilliant. Um, uh, but there is law to the Morrison case. Uh, it's a dissent. The Unitarian view was a dissent by Scalia, not the law. Um, and going forward, if, if I think the people who should be, and I think are most anxious about giving deference to this president on some of these issues, not all, are and should be Unitarians. Because otherwise it looks almost like a pure out sort of a, a theory, right? And, and, and I think they're the ones who are the most concerned that it's not a mindless do whatever you want, um, but you, to, Limiting principles are the hardest thing for judges to write, I think. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I think it has to play a role, whether it's above the fold or below the fold. Here I think there's an easy and interesting sort of trade-off between the two sort of core judicial values. Candor on the one hand, right? Usually we like yeah. judges, judges to articulate the reasons why they're doing things. But on the other hand, what uh, the Dean referred to earlier is the passive virtues, right? Sort of trying to avoid getting into sticky legal territory when you don't need to. And I think both of those are, are valuable things, and here we see courts I think, dealing with the, with the trade-off of the So we have one, you've had your hand up for a while, I'm yeah. sure to get in, it's the last and, question of the day. And this, is, this goes to the entire panel relating to special counsel issue. We've all been talking about any, any violation of the law as to a sitting president. Well, it's possible that what Mueller will discover are violations of the law that occurred before Trump was president. And I guess I'm wondering if the panel's opinion about indictment and whatnot are the same if Mueller discovers not only there, that there might have been some obstruction of yeah. justice while he was sitting as president, right. but there were also some significant violations of the law prior to his election. Right, that's a very good question. Uh, and it, if you read the tea leaves and you're obsessive about calling Politico and Maggie Haberman's tweets and the like, you'll sort of you get you'll follow who's being been appointed to the special counsel staff. And now there's a money laundering expert who's just appointed. And does that mean that they're looking into his business ties pre-presidency and the like? Um, there's a really interesting uh, precedent on this, uh, at least in the civil context. Uh, Bill Clinton, of course, was. The Supreme Court said he could be sued for pre-presidential behavior uh, in, in the Jones versus Clinton case. Whether that that uh, um, case would, would, would extend to criminal liability is a big question. My guess is, I think I'm with Professor Thorpe, but I think assume that your view would be the same. You just can't be that period while in office. Right. Um, I think that's probably right. And if you look at the reasoning in the Jones versus Clinton case, it's a lot about sort of balancing disruptions and the like. 
Uh, that would be my guess. But that's a really interesting question. It's a really hard question. And because it's so interesting and hard, I'm going to say it's too bad we're out of time. <laughs> uh, let me please, before, before just quickly, um, uh, uh, one very quick thing. If you, if you, um, if you didn't get enough today, uh, uh, the dean and I are going to teach a class on presidential power inspired by Professor Mannheim and her colleagues at the University of Washington. We're going to teach a class on Monday afternoons from 4 to 5.30 next semester. Uh, so we need to learn more about presidential power, and then we'll attempt to teach it. And all are welcome. It's open to the public. Um, OK, please join me in thanking these panelists. They've come from Harvard.